Hey, hey everybody. Welcome to the New Discourses Podcast. This is James Lindsay, and we're going to talk about the prophetic church. We're finally going to wrap up with this Politics of Education book from Paulo Freire. Um, Finally, we're going to wrap this up. Sooner or later, I won't leave you hanging. We will go to Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Um, I've got some queer theory fish to fry, though, so that might take a minute. But we've already covered the educational part of this book in previous umpteen episodes. And then in the last half of chapter 10, which is not the last chapter of the book, by the way, it's the last chapter we're going to talk about, Paulo Freire goes on to um, talk about the church and the role of the church and what the church is for and theology and liberation theology. In the 11th chapter, he actually, it's just a page, page and a half long letter of praise to the father of the so-called black liberation theology by James Cone which is like this weird adoption of Catholic Marxism, a.k.a. liberation theology, into a black critical race theory-flavored Protestantism and turned into an absolute grift. And so chapter 11 praises James Cone and black liberation theology, but chapter 10 is about uh, liberation theology and the role of the church. And so in the previous episode, the final episode talking about education, we framed out the first half of this bizarrely religious chapter of the politics of education, which I think we'll have to return to this at some point and read it again, urges educators to live through a personal death and resurrection, their own personal Easter, literally phrased that way, so they can be resurrected on the side of the oppressed, where they can see the world from the perspective of the oppressed, or from what the Chinese would have called the people's standpoint uh, under Mao. And they have to do that if they hope to be able to engage in a true education for liberation, or in fact, in this case, a true prophetic church, a church for liberation. And so the pedagogy of the oppressed is revealed to be, in fact, a process of uh, coming to see, an educational process to teach you to see from the standpoint of the oppressed, which is exactly what the goal of Mao's re-education was. And so we understand that when Paulo Freire is saying that the goal of his process is in fact cultural revolution, that what we saw in China, which he holds up as a positive example, is exactly what he has in mind. Now this whole chapter is ultimately about the ways that people outwardly committed to liberation fail to do it right. It's really a thumbscrew twister on the people who are kind of trying to transform, in this case, the church or education. And it focuses on this idea that some people are failing to go along naively, but some are going along, failing to go along shrewdly. They know that they should be Marxists, but they're not being Marxists. And so they're shrewdly siding with dominance while pretending not to, to see how long they can get away with it. Um, that's going to get really weird as we go through the chapter because this is actually happening, for example, in the large church conventions, religious conventions like the Southern Baptist Convention in Inverse, but the Iron Law of Woke Projection never misses. So through the rest of the chapter after this first part, which we did in the last episode about education, uh, Freire talks less and less about schools and more and more about churches, um, which we heard in the previous episode also are a significant target for the World Economic Forum. In fact, Rick Warren in 2008 went to Davos and spoke for the World Economic Forum and told them explicitly uh, that the, the that they would never accomplish their goals without getting faith as the third leg of the stool, that there are three legs of the stool of society and that those are uh, the public sector, the private sector, in other words, politics, economics, and spirituality, faith being the third. And he said, if you don't get us five and a half billion people plus on board, you're never going to get it. If we resist you, you're never going to get it. So let's repeat here what we actually saw from the World Economic Forum before we kind of dive into uh, how Freire turns away from education kind of as a nominally secular program and turns to his examination of the role of churches. Uh, By the way, importantly, what's happening is that Freire is framing churches as a means of educating. So churches are schools, churches are media platforms. That's how the woke see them. It, but it's just another kind of school, one with, in fact, as, as uh, Klaus Schwab is very clear about, uh, a large amount of capacity to shape values. Values, he says, are not um, shaped merely intellectually. For that, you need faith. And so faith is the third leg of the transformational stool. 
And again, we can thank Rick Warren. Uh, let me name him again, Rick Warren. You know, the Purpose Driven Life Rick Warren? That Rick Warren. Pastor Rick Warren, who wrote The Purpose Driven Life? That guy? Not some other guy with the same name. That guy went to many Davos meetings and sold out the churches uh, to them for this uh, three-legged stool public-private faith message. And here's what, what a white paper that in 2016 when the World Economic Forum was pretty certain for various reasons, namely Hillary Clinton and other political uh, people who actually did win, that they expected to win, um, were, you know, facing election. They, they thought they were going to win everything and they were going to be able to move their plan forward. So they put out a lot of white papers that are very telling in 2016. And another episode we've talked about, and I will go over soon in yet another episode of the podcast, one about um, social and emotional learning. But in 2016, they put out a long white paper about the role of faith. And that's where uh, Klaus Schwab is directly uh, quoted there saying, as a matter of fact, directly quoted saying that uh, values cannot be justified by the intellectual process alone. Faith must be involved. That's what he said. So here's, here's what this white paper says in its introduction. Uh, the World Economic Forum recognizes that faith plays a dynamic and evolving role in our society. Demographic trends suggest the number of faith adherents will increase over the next two decades while the secular population will decrease. People of faith, therefore, have profound impacts on community mobilizing. <laughs> Sounds like something Barack Obama would do. For both productive and damaging purposes. The power of faith to impact global issues and shape global perspectives is a fundamental reason why the forum consistently engages faith leaders and perspectives in our work. As a part of our efforts to incorporate an understanding of the impact of faith in our analysis of complex global trends and challenges, the Forum established the Global Agenda Council on the Role of Faith. Council members comprise the world's foremost experts to provide thought leadership that furthers the faith agenda within Forum's activities. Over its most recent two-year term, the Council worked to raise social awareness about sociocultural cross-faith and religious engagement efforts for the purposes of conflict prevention and societal transformation. How Marxist. Faith to accomplish Marxist goals. Conflict prevention, so they don't want it to be ugly, and societal transformation. The council aimed to transform perspectives on faith in government and in the private sector, especially in nations experiencing dramatic change, which, as we now see a few years later, would be all of them. So beyond the numbers... Beyond just numbers of people, billions, that are faithful, what does the World Economic Forum see within religious faiths? It's not just that there's huge amounts of, num of, of people and money and, and resources and, importantly, distribution networks, educational networks, but what they see is a huge opportunity, an opportunity to reshape values in particular because that's what faith allows them to do, like Klaus Schwab said. And in fact, we get this reiterated by the chair of the Global Agenda Council on the Role of Faith at the World Economic Forum, Brian Grimm, which is a funny name given the circumstances. He says, from climate change to gender parity, the World Economic Forum has identified critical global systemic challenges that require collaboration from across different sectors. Understanding the dynamic role faith has in tackling each is the aim of this set of articles. But why is it important to understand the role of faith? First, to address global and systemic challenges requires not only innovations in policy and practice, but also a commitment to certain values that make the needed policy, economic, and social change, changes sustainable. In other words, when they, when they say sustainable, by the way, what they mean is that the regime that they achieve will be sustainable. They really mean that. In the Handbook on Social-Emotional Learning, for example, they keep explaining that step five in the implementation process of social-emotional learning is sustainability. And what that means is that the programs, when installed, become sustainable within the schools, that they're not going to get taken back or walked back or taken out because you've built in a set of policy demands that make it impossible to get them back out. So when they say sustainable, they mean sustaining their own power. But at any rate... Uh, let me read that part again. Also a commitment to certain values that make the needed policy, economic, and social changes sustainable. See, they're going to transform the world. And if you don't have the values that match the world that they're putting into play, then you're not going to want to keep going and their changes are not going to be sustainable. What they're not telling anybody is how fragile their attempt to take over the world is, how very easily it could fall apart. 
And so they have to transform people's values, or as Herbert Marcuse phrased it in Essay on Liberation, there has to be a transvaluation of values. Values have to be reinterpreted into a new form. You have to have the values that you have be reinterpreted to mean something different than what they were, a transvaluation of values. And he says we're going to get the new world. In fact, he says we're going to get a new sensibility with a new rationality to create a new reality on the back of a biological foundation for socialism that will be achieved by introjection of new values that have been transvaluated or transformed from previous values. Transvaluation means um, it, it, it's it's like reevaluation, except that you're transforming. So you reevaluate your values to change them into something else. You change the meaning of, say, love thy neighbor. You change the meaning of the value so that it means something else. And in fact, what it means is upholding socialism. Every single thing, that that's what communism does. That's just all it does is it transforms every one of your values into how that value can uphold uh, communism. That's it, all it does. It's literally all it does. When they say that they're going to give a critique of something or they have to, we need to bring critical analysis to blah, blah, blah. All that means is that they're going to redefine blah, blah, blah so that it's in terms of upholding communism. Thinking structurally is what they'll usually call it. So anyway, let me just reread that little part again and then carry on. A commitment, so you're going to need, require not only innovations in policy and practice, but also a commitment to certain values, like communism, that make the needed policy, economic, and social changes sustainable, namely ESG, environmental, social, and governance, as defined by the communists trying to take over the world. And values, Grimm tells us, are often rooted in faith. World Economic Forum founder and executive chairman, Professor Klaus Schwab, speaking to the Global Agenda Council on the role of faith, concluded that values cannot be justified by the intellectual process alone, and that faith must be involved. Indeed, faith, including the religious institutions and beliefs that sustain faith, hi, Southern Baptist Convention, are you enjoying your DOJ takeover? where the regime is now going to control the convention and tell the churches what to do, and you're going to hold up your hands and say, oh my gosh, the government made me? including the religious institutions and beliefs that sustain faith, offer a deep spring of values that provide a moral and ethical basis for long-term commitments and actions in supporting, uh, sorry, in support of addressing the challenges. What were the challenges? We go back from climate change to gender parity, blah, blah, blah. Pandemics, whatever they want to throw at us, we have to handle it the way they tell us to. And they're going to install the values of, say, um, complicity, compliance, actually. There, there's ESG, by the way, is kind of on the ropes, if you haven't noticed. It's still dominant, but it's getting punched pretty hard and it's getting knocked around. And so there's been a suggestion that it needs to be uh, replaced with other things or adjusted or whatever. And uh, what is it? Something like risk sustainability and compliance or something like that was put forth as a possible uh, a possible um, alternative. Compliance. Compliance is a value. They want you to comply with the orders from the unelected global government that they're trying to create because you're a good global citizen. And that's what we're all having to pay attention to is global citizenship. Because as the dialectic turns out of woke, which is kind of a new world or a new world order, I guess, idealism, uh, ideal realm platonic identity politics and it twists into this sustainability material politics and the dialectic grinds out of that eventually into its next global cultural consciousness will be the thing that they have to raise and so we have to think of ourselves as global citizens as the dialectic progresses um, so that's what we're actually talking about and faith is necessary they need faith in order to transform the world they need your faith as a matter of fact to be transvalued they need the values that you hold and that are reaffirmed by your faith to be transvaluated into a new set of values, a new form that will uphold sustainably the program that they have in vision. So it's into this space that the ideas of Paulo Ferreri now tested out in education, successful in education, having conquered the colleges of education and from there grabbing the teachers and from there grabbing all of the students. It is from there in religion, you're going to see that they're going to have to capture the what? Seminaries. Those are the analog of the colleges of education. You're not training teachers, you're training pastors who are in another sense a kind of teacher. So you're going to capture the seminaries to capture the pastors, to capture the laity that come to 
the congregations that come to the church services, and that's how you're going to do it. And guess what? They already have the seminaries. They already have them. And now they're going after the convention so that they can get the churches on board from another angle, from kind of a policy-based angle, a top-down, I don't know, something looking like a public-private partnership, but it's actually, in this case, a public-faith partnership because the Department of Justice is moving in. It is into this space that the idea is Apollo Ferrari because they will conquer an educational space. They will steal education. They will also steal the transmission of faith. That's where these come in from some 30 years earlier. This is where they gain their contemporary context. And chapter 10 of The Politics of Education makes that clear. Again, the title of this chapter is Education, Liberation, and the Church. So it's not that much about education like we talked about in the previous episode. Now, we did leave off in the previous episode discussing the ways in which Paulo Freire envisions an education for liberation, as he calls it. Um, that's where we left off, I should say. We didn't leave out. We left off uh, from the previous episode discussing those ways, the, the education for liberation that he sets up his discussion of the church from. And so now about a third of the way through or a quarter of the way through the chapter, it turns sharply to the role played by the church. And where we left off, if you are a regular follower, if you're just listening because you're a churchgoer or you're a pastor or whatever and you're interested in this episode, you can go back and listen to the previous episode. They all build off of each other. But we left off with Paulo Freire explaining why it isn't possible to have liberatory education in the untransformed world. So you have to have transformation of the world before you have the transformed education. It's a bit circular. Um and thus suggesting that the way that we would have to get there is to simply start doing it, not through technique, but through conviction to a new system. Um, and I identified that in the previous episode with the WISC model of education, WSCC WISC, which stands for whole school, whole child, whole community model of education. So anywhere you see those words, we're going to educate the whole child, you should probably freak out. It's not the school's job. Definitely not what should be going on. It's Marxist program should not be educating the whole child, and you shouldn't be doing it through the whole school, and you shouldn't be doing it through the whole community in partnership with it so that you have one huge reflexive monster. Um, turns out they're actually building these social-emotional learning churches already. You can go on castle.org, C-A-S-E-L dot O-R-G, uh, the Castle website, and you can look up um, their their task force for, uh, it's not a task force, it's a initiative for um, creating what they call communities of practice which are social-emotional learning community churches. They're not real churches. They don't teach a, a explicit theology. They teach this woke Marxist theology. Um, and the goal is to make it so the entire community, not just the school, not just every subject in the school, not just every extracurricular activity at the school, but the home, the store, the, everything, everything reflects social-emotional learning brainwashing back into the students. And they're going to call them communities of practice, which are going to be churches but devoted to a completely different religion. And if they can scoop up your church to bring in your faith angle to transmute those values or transvalue those values, they will. But we're sticking with Freire here. And Freire turns explicitly religious at this point in the chapter, about a third of the way through, and says actually that what he's offering is a matter of prophecy. And you have to read that given the history. If you understand the theology of Marxism, if you don't, you're going to be a little lost here. And I can't cover everything in every freaking podcast to keep you up. There's just too damn much going on. Um, but what the whole thing, the whole Marxist program is um, hermetic alchemy um, that's being driven by Gnostic heresy. And if you don't understand that, we're, we're completely lost. But when he says it's a matter of prophecy, what it actually means is alchemical prophecy or hermetic prophecy. So it's a prophecy made within the faith tradition of the mystery religion of hermetic alchemy. And so what does that look like? What is that prophecy? It's, it, they're all self-fulfilling prophecies where you project out into the world what you want to see, and then you do the work to make it happen. That's how they work. So you project the circumstances that you want to bring about into the world, the activism you, that you want to achieve, and then you get people to believe that that's what's happening and that they have to go along with it. In fact, that it's inevitable if they don't go along with it. So they go along with it, making it come true. Somebody might come to, a, say, a pastor and say, Pastor, something's going on in the world. There's nothing you can do to stop it. It's inevitable. But if you help us along, make these small changes, you're going to be able to facilitate this. You're going to fit in with the changes, and you're going to be taken care of. If you try to resist it, it's an inevitable change. You're not going to be able to resist it. That's a prophecy in the hermetic faith. We're going to transform the world, and you're either going to come with us or you're going to be destroyed. And so a lot of people believe that because they are scared or something, or they're offered you know, a nice, sweet uh 
you know, fellowship or lots of money or a grant or some cool opportunity to go out on some yacht for a few weeks or something, whatever it happens to be. So they go along with it and make it come true. That's how an alchemical prophecy works. That's how hermeticism actually works in the world as a kind of fake magical uh, mystery of religion. And that's exactly what Freire is referring to because that's what Marxism is. Um, so I'm not interpreting things here, by the way, when I call it prophetic. This is exactly what Paulo Freire is talking about. The entire, in fact, the rest of the chapter is dedicated to the development or the emergence of what Freire calls the prophetic church, which is what the last section in the chapter is about, is the prophetic church. Now, in the if you remember the introduction to this book, you got to go way back. And if you're new here on the podcast, don't worry, we'll cover it at some point. Uh, I think soon. I have it in my notes. Uh, Henry Drew, in the foreword or the introduction that he wrote to this book, explained what's meant by the fact that Paulo Freire is offering a permanent prophetic vision for both education and for religion. And in that permanent prophetic vision for a communist future, he's offering hope. And that's, again, for the future of education and the society it produces, including the churches within it. And in fact, using the churches to get there through that transvaluation of values, it has to occur. And so Ferrari will compare this prophetic church against the reactionary church, which is obviously counter-revolutionary and bad, and also against the modernizing church, which plays this kind of naive, shrewd role that I mentioned at the beginning, where you, uh, you know, there's this kind of um, attempt to rewrite Christianity happening and get everybody on board and by by pushing a Marxist um, kind of good versus evil lens into the to the to the framing of the church and what being in the church involves. And so this is obviously some false prophet kind of stuff when he talks about it being a prophetic vision, a permanent prophetic vision, as a matter of fact, uh, but also a prophetic church. And so. Um, Let's go look back at Paul, uh, Henry Drew's introduction. Um, it's in a section in the introduction that Ferry wrote called Liberation Theology and the Language of Possibility. And when we look back at this kind of very enthusiastic evangelist, Henry Drew, who was writing on behalf of Paulo Freire when he wrote the introduction to this book, remember Drew is the person who made Freire a thing in the U.S. He wasn't a thing until until Drew got sucked into the cult, went Paulo crazy and then pulled him like did did the work. He got hundreds of Marxists tenured as professors of education, and then he thrust this book in 1985 in front of them. He gets hooked on the Freire cult in the late 70s. By 1985, he's got the kind of runway built, and this book is going to take off the plane of the critical theft of education. Okay, and so I think that when we hear what Paulo Freire, or sorry, what Henry Drew had to say about Paulo Freire and his role with the church, it's going to be very chilling now. He said, and I read this in an episode where I read the introduction to this book in, entirely, actually across two episodes, but um, what, he's, what he wrote was that central to Freire's politics and pedagogy is a philosophical vision of a liberated humanity. Remember, that's very Marxist. The nature of this vision is rooted in a respect for life, as Marxists see it, and the acknowledgement that the hope and vision of the future that inspire it are not meant to provide consolation for the oppressed, as much as to promote ongoing forms of critique and to struggle against objective forces of oppression. So when they say life, by the way, they you don't have real life until there's no oppression, so to, everybody has to be freed up from the fall of man that is the division of labor, and we have to live in communism. That's the way their religion works. By combining the dynamics of critique and collective struggle, this is what Giroux says in the introduction, by combining the dynamics of critique and collective struggle with a philosophy of hope, Freire has created a language of possibility that is rooted in what he calls a permanent prophetic vision. Underlying this prophetic vision is a faith that, as Dorothy Sowell calls it, or sorry, argues in Choosing Life, that, quote, makes life present to us and so makes it possible. It is a great yes to life, one that presupposes our power to struggle, end quote. So, continuing with Giroux, Freire's attack against all forms of oppression, his call to link ideolo ideology critique with collective action, and the prophetic vision central to his politics are heavily indebted to the spirit and ideological dynamics that have both informed and characterized the theologies of liberation that have emerged primarily from Latin America since the early 1970s, let me make it very, very clear here that Giroux is making it unambiguous that what Paulo Freire's 
vision is that became the basis for woke is a religion. It is not ambiguous. I'm sorry, whatever people you're listening to who want to go on podcasts and say, woke is not a religion. I can't help you when it says that it literally is a religion right here. I can't help you. Underlying his prophetic vision is a faith that is a great yes that presupposes our power to struggle. This is a religion. It's a faith. It's not ambiguous. We'll do more podcasts explaining how it's a faith as we go forward because that's apparently necessary. You can also go watch the videos that we're putting out right now on the Sovereign Nations channel where I gave a three-part lecture series along with my friend Michael O'Fallon who gave a three-part lecture series with some panels interspersed in between in Phoenix, Arizona at the beginning of June. Those are coming out now where we outline the dialectical faith of leftism, the theology of Marxism, and how it's going to develop and what it's doing and how it's getting into everything in the world. It's a huge important piece. So I encourage you to go look those up on the Sovereign Nations YouTube channel and watch those videos. But anyway, back to this being a religion, it's straight out of liberation theology, he just said, and in truly dialectical fashion, so we know it's the Marxist dialectical faith. Freire has criticized and rescued the radical underside of revolutionary Christianity. In case you wonder what it is. This is the basis of woke and the basis, so woke is a religion right? We've got that. That's clear. And if you're a Christian, it's a heresy that's poisoning your faith. You should probably be aware of these things. So as the reader will discover in this book, Freire is a harsh critic of the reactionary church. That's probably your church, by the way. If you don't agree with woke, it's definitely your church. At the same time, he situates his faith and sense of hope in the God of history and of the oppressed. The God of history and of the oppressed. So what is that? Well, that's Marx. That's the Marxist take on the structure of history, but now actually calling it God instead of it being the projected perfected man at the end of history. The God of history is the uh, power that moves along. In fact, the God of history is the true God behind the demiurge uh, in the Gnostic tr- uh, tradition, the true supreme being that lets history unfold through the activity and thought and the work of humans. But we're going to put, uh, he situates his, remember, somebody, somebody out there, Chris Rufo, is telling us that this is not a religion, but he situates his faith and sense of hope in the God of history and the oppressed, whose teachings make it impossible, in Ferrari's words, to, quote, reconcile Christian love with the exploitation of human beings. Within the discourse of theologies of liberation, Freire fashions a powerful theoretical antidote to the cynicism and despair of many left radical critics. The utopian character of his analysis is concrete in its nature and appeal, and takes as its starting point collective actors in their various historical settings and the the particularity of their problems and forms of oppression. It is utopian, and this is the key part, it's in bold in my notes. It is utopian only in the sense that it refuses to surrender to the risks and dangers that face all challenges to dominant power structures. It is prophetic in that it views the kingdom of God as something to be created on earth, but only through a faith in both other human beings and the necessity of permanent struggle. Is anybody confused about what we're working with here? Please tell me if you're confused. The notion of faith that emerges in Freire's work is informed by the memory of the oppressed, the suffering that must not be allowed to continue, and the need to never forget that the prophetic vision is an ongoing process, a vital aspect of the very nature of human life. Remember that the Supreme Court says that what makes a religion is that it's a system of belief and practice that answers fundamental questions about the world and man's role in it, such that it gives rise to duties of conscience. The need to never forget, this is back to Giroud, the need to never forget that the prophetic vision is an ongoing process that presumably you're going to have to participate in, a vital aspect of the very nature of human life. Oh, okay. In short, by combining the discourses of critique and possibility, Freire joins history and theology in order to provide the theoretical basis for a radical pedagogy that combines hope, critical reflection, and collective struggle. It is at this juncture that the work of Paulo Freire becomes crucial the development of a radical pedagogy, which is in all of our schools, and is taking over your church. 
For in Ferrari, we find the dialectician of contradictions and emancipation. In Ferrari's work, a discourse is developing that bridges the relationship between agency and structure. A discourse that situates human action in, con in constraints forged in historical and contemporary practices, while also pointing to the spaces, contradictions, and forms of resistance that raise the possibility for social struggle. I will conclude by turning briefly to those theoretical elements in Freire's work that are vital for developing a new language and theoretical foundation for a radical theory of pedagogy, particularly in the North American context, where installing, at least in the United States, a religion in sco public schools is against the First Amendment. It is a huge First Amendment violation, but never mind. So that's Giroux on the religion that we're dealing with here. And it is going to be a heresy that is infecting your churches, and the mechanism will be the same. Ferrari's ideas were brought into the Colleges of Education. The Colleges of Education trains the teachers and administrators that went on to uh, indoctrinate, or actually Marxist program, like Mao did reprogramming or re-education, program the children. So capture the colleges of education, get the teachers and administrators, indoctrinate and program the children. That's the, that's education. And then capture the seminaries, train the future theologians, pastors, and church administrators so that you can get the laity. That's the same process. It's already in process or progress. The uh, Unfortunately for you, it took them about 30 or 40 years to figure it out in education, and things are going to move a little faster in churches. And you're about 10 out of, it'll probably take about 15 years for the full transformation, and you're over 10 years into this process, maybe 12. So it will flip, it will flip quick, and we're in the process of bringing the public sector through the Department of Justice into uh, not the churches specifically, but the Convention of Churches, for example, the Southern Baptist Convention on trumped up nonsense that was designed specifically to do this. Well, so welcome to the future of your uh, faith. It will have to be prophetic on Marxist terms unless we put a stop to this. And so let me let me make an important note for pastors. Your primary job is to shepherd souls and the people that uh, have them, if I might make so bold. And so everybody who gets sucked into this is committing a heresy. And if you believe what you believe, you know where they're going because of it. And so you might really want to make a stand. This isn't, you know, if, if the Great Commission means anything, you really might want to think about doing everything you can to prevent large numbers of human beings from getting sucked into a Christian-looking heresy or cult that's going to get them uh, into a bad result. So just something to think about there. But now that some of these things are starting to make sense, once we start to realize how successful Drew was about bringing these Frarian ideas into education, making them applicable throughout all of North America, and particularly the United States, um, we can see more clearly how the critical turn in education was uh, a huge theft of education, and but it was also a not a critical turn, but a theological turn in education to the theology of Marxism. Okay, the, let me say that again. The critical turn in education, which has book-length treatments about it, some of which we've read here on the podcast, the critical turn in education is a theological turn in education to the theology of Marxism. It will be the same in your churches. It will be a theological turn to a uh, theology of Marxism wearing a pastor's frock. I know that pastors just wear like t-shirts and jeans and priests wear frocks, but we can get past these things. So our college of colleges of education became Marxist seminaries, and our schools became Marxist religious schools or Sunday schools using Frarian thought reform to transform our kids into change agents dedicated to transforming the world. Now, Klaus Schwab sees the potential in this and says, wow, we could not only do this in schools, we could do this in churches because that's where you're really going to transform values. He sees the opportunity in schools through pushing social emotional learning, which he will have a whole thing on that coming up soon big time into that, but it's also going to happen in a huge world economic forum agenda through transformed churches. And from what I understand, social emotional learning is actually happening in churches now too. Aren't you guys just so clever falling for that trick? So let's move on. Let's actually read Ferrari. We've got this, we've spent a long time setting this up. You have to understand though what's actually happening here. Um, you have to know what he was envisioning, what it was about, and how other how it's been used to push this huge neo-communist agenda, including through the church as a transformer of values and a gigantic media outlet and school to teach the new values for the new world. So the last thing that we left off with previously was Ferrari remarking that truly liberating education can only be put into practice outside of the ordinary system, and even then with great cautiousness by those who overcame, or sorry, who overcome their naivety and commit themselves to authentic liberation. So you got to be a full-blown Marxist cultist. 
Um, this is another reiteration of the idea that only the conscientized, only the brainwashed, only the Marxist cultists who have gone all the way through a so-called Marxist death and rebirth, that is, a woke resurrection, can, or a woke Easter if you want, can take up the truly liberating educational approach. And even then, only in the context that constantly denounces and refuses the existing order completely. That's the mechanism of the Frarian model. Constant denunciation of whatever is. Will they get their way? That's a new thing that is. You denounce that too. Nothing's ever good enough. What's a contemporary example in politics? I don't know. They passed this gigantic fake inflation reduction act that's actually... Uh, you know, something completely different like the Build Back Better bill uh, in a new outfit. And the second they get it, um, you see an article in Vox coming out and saying, well, it does all these sweeping changes, but it doesn't even talk about how climate damaging beef production is. It doesn't go far enough. The second you get the thing, you denounce that thing too. That's the mechanism. You don't have to have a grand conspiracy where everybody's read Freire or everybody's read Marx or everybody's read Marcuse or Mao or Lenin or Stalin or any of these people in order to do this. You only have tr to train people to see the world as intrinsically a problem and den to denounce whatever there is and do that endlessly. That's just literally two things. And then they will go and tear apart the world like a, an acid that will dissolve everything. Okay. So... Turns out that this idea, though, of needing to recreate the whole of education in this way that Freire's talking about, he also sees this in religion. This is before 1985, so, you know, he's lo looking back, and this was written probably in the 70s while he was in Geneva, if I had to guess, uh, working for the World Council of Churches, and what he said then already then, as he said, a grown, growing number of Christians in Latin America are discovering these things and finding themselves forced to take sides, either to change their naivety into shrewdness and constantly align themselves with the ideology of domination, or to join forces with the oppressed and in full identification with them seek true liberation. We've already stated that if they renounce their uncritical adherence to the dominant classes, their new apprenticeship with the people presents a challenge. In meeting this challenge, they encounter risks formerly unknown. Okay, now, i got to do some clarifying here. First of all, the apprenticeship that he's referring to is the personal Easter, the literal death and resurrection thing that you're supposed to go through, or it doesn't count. And so he says you have to die and be reborn on the side of the oppressed. And so now we're going to see him retool Christianity and Christian practices into Marxist liberation theology in that fashion. And we'll come back to that in just a second, continuing with his words. The other thing that I want to point out already, and get this in your head, is that he says that there's this naive and the shrewd, right? Well, the, And what do the, they do? Well, the naive don't understand the nature of power, but the shrewd understand the nature, nature of power, and they suck up to the existing power. So what you would have is this inversion of what he's actually talking about going on in the world today. There are certain among your churches who are, in fact, very shrewdly aligning with the new dominant power structure that's coming in, pretending something else is the dominant power structure. The old way is still dominant when everybody knows that's not true. You don't get kicked off of Twitter for echoing the regime. You get kicked off of Twitter for challenging the regime. We know where the power is. So the shrewd people are the ones that suck up to the existing power to make things in line with it while trying to look like they're not. Can you name anybody who's doing that, like Russell Moore, Moore or Al Mohler? Can you think of anybody? Legan Duncan, maybe? Can you think of some people who are doing that? Pope Francis, perhaps? I don't know. Maybe that one was a little bit off. Um, you can think of some people that are in that category. We'll come back to these people. They're pretending to be somebody who's protecting the church for the people, if you will. I mean, be care careful with that because the Marxists own that terminology. But in fact, they are sucking up to and aligning with the new dominant power that they think is an inevitable transforming agent that they have to go along with. And in so doing, they're creating the conditions under which the alchemical prophecy can be fulfilled. Alchemical prophecies are only fulfilled when people believe them and go along with them. They are reflexive. They are not true. The inevitability of a reflexive move is only there when people believe it's inevitable and make it come true. And then everything collapses because it's alchemy and magic's fake. It turns out when you make the elixir of life, you're still drinking mercury, you still go crazy, you still die. Doesn't work. Okay, so let's go back and review quickly before I go on forward again. Also, this personal Easter death resurrection thing. Let me just go and read that section to you again. It's going to come up a few times in this, so better to just cover it. This is the part earlier in the same chapter where Paulo Freire talks about the need for a Easter for educators and religious leaders. And he says that, uh, like we like was just mentioned, he says, um, 
you know, so you've gone through, he says, in committing themselves to the oppressed, they begin a new period of apprenticeship. This is not, however, to say that their commitment to the oppressed is thereby finally sealed. It will be severely tested during the course of this new apprenticeship when confronted in a more serious and profound way than ever before with the hazardous nature of existence. To pass such a test is not easy, he says. This new apprenticeship will violently break down the elitist concept of existence they had absorbed while being ideologized. The sine qua non, the apprenticeship demands, is that first of all, they really experience their own Easter. That they die as elitists, so as to be resurrected on the side of the oppressed. That they be born again with the beings who are not allowed to be. Such a process implies a renunciation of myths that are dear to them, the myth of their superiority, of the purity of their soul, of their virtues, their wisdom, the myth that they save the poor, the myth of the neutrality of the church, of theology, of education, science, technology, the myth of their own impartiality, From these grow the other myths of the inferiority of other people, of their spiritual and physical impurity, and of the absolute ignorance of the oppressed. This Easter, he says, which results in the changing of consciousness, must be existentially experienced. The real Easter is not commemorative rhetoric. It is praxis. It is historical involvement. P.S. That means it is Marxism. The old Easter of rhetoric is dead with no hope of resurrection, Paulo Freire says about your Easter. Christians. It is only in the authenticity of historical praxis, that means Marxist activism, that's all it means. It is only in the authenticity of historical praxis that Easter becomes the death that makes life possible. But the bourgeois worldview, basically necrophiliac, which means death-loving, and therefore static, is unable to accept this supremely biophiliac, meaning life-loving, experience of Easter. The bourgeois mentality, which is far more than just a convenient abstraction, kills the profound historical dynamism of Easter and turns it into no more than a date on the calendar. The lust to possess, a sign of the necrophiliac worldview, rejects the deeper meaning of resurrection. Why should I be interested in rebirth if I hold in my hands as objects to be possessed the torn body and soul of the oppressed? I can only experience rebirth at the side of the oppressed by being born again with them in the process of liberation. I cannot turn such a rebirth into a means of owning the world, since it is essentially a means of transforming the world. That's what Freire says about that. That's the context in which we're working. Let's not forget it. And so he's talking about this apprenticeship. That's what he's talking about. And here's how he's going to retool Christianity and Christian practice to his Marxist liberation theology schema with the help of these modernizers who are shrewd in their uh, devilry, we'll say. Um, So he says, during what we are calling their new apprenticeship, many Christians soon realized that previously when they had engaged in purely palliative action, whether social or religious, for example, fervent support of maxims such as, quote, the family that prays together stays together, they were praised for their Christian virtues. They now begin to realize, however, that the family that prays together also needs a house, employment, bread, clothing, health, and education for their children that they need to express themselves in their world by creating and recreating it, in other words, being Marxist, that their bodies, the souls, and dignity must be respected if they are to stay together in more than suffering and misery. So we're going to now transform the meaning of the family that prays together stays together by saying that it requires all this Marxist crap to make it work. As the memes say, sounds like communist propaganda, but okay. Quote, back to Ferrari, when they begin to see all of this, they find their very faith being called into question by those who wish to have even more political, economic, and ecclesiastical power for reshaping of the consciousness of others. In other words, when they begin to see that there's more to it than just their naive faith, when they begin to waken up and have some consciousness to the Marxist nature of reality, and they say something... They'll go to their pastor, and their pastor will say, we have to question your faith. Maybe your faith in God is being shaken. And so that Freire is criticizing. He's saying that that is a manipulation of power, as a matter of fact. And it's always the same excuse, isn't it? It's not that they're becoming heretics. It's that the established authorities want to maintain their power over them, right? It's not that they're adopting Marxism or woke Christianity and becoming a heretic. It's that the established order wants to maintain its power. It's not keeping out Marxism for good reasons. It's keeping out Marxism for uh, selfish reasons. Um, In other words, you know, their broken logic 
is that corruption exists, so everything but Marxism is corrupt. That's their logic. And the iron law of woke projection, which here transforms into the iron law of woke corruption, never misses. It's the same Gnostic confusion we're seeing again and again, too. They only know the real truth and see through, or sorry, only they, because they have their, their, um, what am I saying? They, only they, because they have the special insight, the taste of gnosis. Only they know the real truth and can see through the illusions and corruptions. Most people just go along with the illusion and corruption. There's, they start to be awakened. They're told that they are not. In other words, the cult is saying that everybody else is trying to keep you in a cult, as they do. So only the Gnostics, only they, as ever, can see. And of course, the iron law of woke projection, yet again, never misses. So Freire goes on, as their new apprenticeship begins to show more clearly the dramatic situation in which they live and which leads them to undertake action that is less paternalistic, they come to be seen as diabolic. And we see the same thing again. Less paternalistic, really. So here, by the way, there's a footnote, and he cites as an example the character of, by name, Dom Helder Camara, the so-called Red Bishop of Recife, spiritual mentor in many regards to Paulo Freire himself, but also Pope Francis and to Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum. Schwab brought uh, Camara to Davos in 1974 at tremendous risk to himself and the World Economic Forum. That's the same year it created the Davos Manifesto. And it did, its risk existed because um, Camara was a communist. And in the 70s, it was illegal to have a communist speak openly as such in Switzerland. So he brings them together, and the business people he has at the Davos meeting in the 74 was just his third year. Uh, they didn't want a communist speaking either. And so Schwab took a huge risk and says, in fact, in an interview, that he, could, he risked it all. He could have lost everything. He could have gotten in trouble. Um, but he risked everything because it was so important to bring his new, this man in from Recife, from Brazil, to teach them about the poor and about the true nature of oppression. In other words, communism. And he was willing to risk it all to bring a communist in to speak at the World Economic Forum in its fourth year of existence, 71, 72, 73, 74, fourth year of existence. Um, Paula Freire says that Dom Hiller Kamara, in this footnote, is one such devil uh, accused by the outside world of being a dangerous heretic, and of course unjustly. He's not a real priest, he's a dangerous heretic, he's a devil. He's been infected by a demon or whatever it is. No, 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 no. He's the one that has the true Christianity, which is exactly what any cult would do, is say that everybody else has it wrong. We're the only ones who have it right because it's a Gnostic cult. Um, it's kind of funny, I guess, how accurate these people were about him and how mad his critics, uh, Camara's critics were about him and how mad Ferrari was about it. And Schwab was also mad about that too. Um, this is what the footnote says, in fact. It says, Quote, they are denounced as serving an international demonic force that threatens Western Christian civilization. A civilization, this isn't the footnote, sorry, this is in the text. Uh, they are denounced as serving an international demonic force that threatens Western Christian civilization. Yeah, communism. A civilization that in reality has very little that's Christian about it. Uh, yeah, they are denouncing an international demonic force that threatens Western Christian civilization and Western civilization overall. Correct. Based. Absolutely. Thus, they discover through praxis, Freire says, that their innocent period was not in the least impartial. So you were naive, you were innocent, but you had a side. That's why they have to destroy childhood innocence in queer theory and critical race theory, and apparently also in critical pedagogy and in uh, liberation theology. They discover through praxis that their innocent period was not in the least impartial. Innocence is something you construct so that people will grow up and be indoctrinated in the existing society rather than trying to challenge it. So it was never impartial. In fact, it was a tool of domination that they got suckered in by. So what do you have to do? Destroy childhood innocence, of course. Freire goes on, but at this point, many are afraid. They lose the courage to face the existential risk of historical commitment, of becoming a communist, with all the not good that comes with that. They return to their idealistic illusions, but now as the members of a shrewd camp. So you blow people's minds open. You start to turn into a Marxist. They get cold feet. They don't go along with it, or they think it's a terrible idea, but now they know. They know the real nature of oppression, but now they're intentionally siding with evil power. And so what he's saying here is your reborn woke church leaders and educators that are starting 
uh, they start getting accurately identified as communists and lose their nerve and back off. If they oppose the movement now, they're no longer ignorant fools, but evil dissenters and apostates. Uh, they're people who could tell the truth on the Marxists. They're people like uh, Manning Johnson, who was a Communist Party member. He was a black man, and he started to tell the truth about how the Communist Party in the 30s and 40s and 50s in the United States used black people to advance their agenda by using kind of a pre-critical race theory, um, race agenda, and so on. We could go on and on about different people who have spun out of the cult. And so like any cult, there's no agreeing, no disagreeing with its totalizing nature. It is totalizing. You can't disagree with a single aspect of it. So if you disagree with it, it's never for true reasons or good reasons. It's only willful betrayal. If you know what the cult teaches and then you expose the cult, it's willful betrayal. The communists in China rounded up tons and tons and tons of Westerners when uh, they took power and imprisoned them in these thought reform prisons on accusations of espionage merely for talking about what life was like in China to other people who might have told the West. There's only willful betrayal. And the point of the thought reform prison was to teach them to be able to see how what they did counted as spying and espionage against the Chinese people and did harm to the Chinese people, even though all they were doing was going about their daily life, talking about the experience that they were having as the country went communist. There's only betrayal of the cult. Tell the truth about the cult and you betray it. And so people who have been pulled in are no longer naive. They're shrewd and they're therefore extra evil. So Freire is saying here that apostates from the cult have no excuse, that they want to be evil. And so that's used to discredit them and to get people to dissociate from them. It's like nasty guilt by association. And so these are the challenges that these apprentices might face as they try to go through their own Easter. They have to die and be reborn. Perpetually, we'll find out over and over and over again. So someone might tell them the truth is the problem and wake them up before they're all in. And Freire gets pretty unhinged about this. He says they need to be able to justify their return. Hence, they claim that the masses who are, quote, uneducated and incapable must be protected from losing their faith in God, which is, quote, so beautiful, so sweet, and so edifying, end quote. They must be protected from the, quote, subversive evil of the false Christians who praise the Chinese Cultural Revolution and admire the Cuban Revolution, end quote. Really says that. They, they, he's mocking people who say that. They sign up for the defense of the faith when what they are really defending is their own class interests to which that faith is subordinated. The dude's just a straight-up commie, right? And so he's setting the terms by which education and your churches are being transformed. And, you know, I went on a podcast with Al Mohler one time, and he's the only person, the first person I ever sat down and talked with, and it's so rare even to this day, who tracked with me when I talked about Paulo Freire. It's almost like Al Mohler knows who Paulo Freire is and what he wrote. Man's kind of smart. He's sort of a genius. And he's very, very well read. He's the only person who ever tracked with me. Turns out it's Paulo Freire's program being implemented through the Southern Baptist Convention. How weird that he tracked with me. How weird. But anyway, they must, Freire says, then insist on the neutrality of the church. See, the church has to stay neutral. That's what people will say whose fundamental task, they say, is to reconcile the irreconcilable through maximum social stability. They don't like stability in communist land. Thus, they castrate the prophetic dimension of the church, whose witness becomes one of fear, fear of change, fear of an unjust, fear that an unjust world will be radically transformed, fear of getting lost in an uncertain future. But a church that refuses historical involvement is never, nevertheless involved in history. See, Either you're a Marxist involved in history or you're involved in history anyway on the wrong side of it by resisting Marxist trans transformation and refusing to join the cause. You have no choice. You're always part of the process of history. The entire explanation of the universe is dialectical, and you're either on the right side of it or the wrong side of it. That's all there is. So remember, a religion, according to First Amendment jurisprudence in the United States, is a comprehensive system of belief and practice that answers fundamental questions about the world and man's role in it, like that it's universally dialectic and man's role is to progress the dialectic by joining along with its progressive agenda, such that it gives rise to duties of conscience. In other words, that you have to be on the right side of it. You have to do the things that Freire's indicating here you have to do. It's a religion very clearly a religion. So the only right choice, sorry, uh, I skipped a line on my notes. Freire says, in fact, those who preach that the church is outside history contradict themselves in practice because they automatically place themselves at the side of those who refuse to allow the oppressed classes to be. So the only right choice, as Marx said in his critique of Hegel, 
is to abolish the conditions that make religion necessary in the first place. That's what he said. If we go back to the economic and philosophical, no, no, sorry, this is his critique of Hegel. I just said that. Duh. Um, Marx's critique of Hegel on the very first page of the introduction, um, he says that uh, the abolition of religion as the illusory happiness of the people is the demand for their real happiness. To call on them to give up their illusions about their condition is to call on them to give up a condition that requires illusions. The criticism of religion is therefore an embryo, the criticism of that veil of tears of which religion is the halo. Criticism is plucked the imaginary flowers of the chain, not in order that man shall continue to bear that chain without fantasy or consolation, but so he will throw off the chain and pluck the living flower. The criticism of religion disillusions man so that he will think, act, and fashion his reality like a man who has discarded his illusions and regained his senses, so that he will move around himself as his own true son. Religion is only the illusory sun which revolves around man as long as he does not revolve around himself. It is therefore the task of history, once the other world of truth has vanished, that's religion, to establish the truth of this world. It is the immediate task of philosophy, which is in the service of history, to unmask self-estrangement in its unholy forms, once the holy form of human self-estrangement has been unmasked. So you have to get rid of the religious uh, self-estrangement so that you can realize that you're being self that your humans are being estranged from themselves by the secular or mundane conditions. Thus, the criticism of heaven turns into the criticism of earth, the criticism of religion into the criticism of law, and the criticism of theology into the criticism of politics. We've covered Marx on this point before. That's the only thing you can do. Marx said, you have to abolish the conditions that make religion necessary in the first place. That's Freire's objective. So, afraid of this uncertainty, Freire tells us, and anxious to avoid the risk of a future that must always be constructed and not just received, the church badly loses its way. It can no longer test itself, either through the denunciation of the unjust world or the enunciation of a more just world to be built by the historical social praxis of the oppressed. In this situation, the church can, no, can, uh, can be no more utopian, prophetic, or filled with hope than are the ruling classes to which it is allied. Deprived of its prophetic vision, it takes the road of formalism and bureaucratic rights where hope Detached from the future becomes only an alienated and alienating abstraction. Given that he was raised Catholic, we could make some jokes here. Instead of stimulating the pilgrim, it invites him to stand still. Basically, it is a church that forbids the, itself the Easter it preaches. It is a church that is freezing to death, unable to respond to the aspirations of a troubled utopian and biophile life-loving youth to whom one can no longer speak a medieval language. Latin, and who are not interested in discussing the sex of angels, for these youth are challenged by the drama of their own history. Most of these young people are well aware that the basic problem in Latin America is not the laziness of the people or their inferiority or their lack of education. The problem is imperialism, and they know that this imperialism is neither abstraction nor slogan but tangible reality, an invading, destroying presence until this basic contradiction is overcome Latin America and the rest of the third world cannot develop, it can only modernize, for without liberation, there can be no development of dependent societies. Now, Klaus Schwab says basically the same thing in The Great Narrative, uh, For a Better Future, as he calls it, the second book of The Great Reset. I don't know if I have that. I definitely don't have that open, like I can just jump on it. But he says that that's what's going to have to happen, is that the young people are going to have to, like, they demand a completely new world. They don't care about all, all all this old stuff and the old values. They see climate change. They see a world of danger. They see a world that's financially screwing them over and that they don't think that they're going to have a future. And, and so they have a completely different view and that they're going to want, they, they absolutely need to have a new social contract as a result. Um, he, that's Klaus Schwab's view of it. So let me see if I can find that real quickly because he says social contract a few times. It does say that the manifestations of inequality are so multifaceted and reach such proportions to address uh, that it demands nothing short of a redefinition of the social contract. But I want to find the part where he says it about the young people because um, I know he's, he does say that. Uh, rising concern 
uh, about inequality and the profound sentiment of dissatisfaction, if not anger, that it provokes will prompt many societies around the world, this is Klaus Schwab, by the way, to redefine the terms of their social contract. Broadly defined, the social contract refers to the often implicit set of arrangements and expectations that govern the relations between individuals and institutions. Put simply, it is the glue that binds us our societies together. Without it, the social fabric unravels. The, gl- the growing general recognition is that the social contract in many countries around the world is broken, that its multiple elements from cradle to grave need to change. Um, and he says this about the young people in particular, uh, that the young people, I'm trying to find where this is quickly, the young people uh, are really the people pushing this, that they absolutely need it. Um, the policy solutions, there are policy solutions that do exist and broadly consist in adapting the welfare state to today's world by empowering people and responding to the demands for a fairer social contract. Um, he says over the past few years, several international organizations and think tanks have adjusted to this new reality and outlined proposals on how to make it happen. But the pandemic has marked a turning point. And then he says, what form will this take? And he kind of ram- rambles for a moment, but then he ends up saying that, uh, here it is. The most, uh, where is this? While reflecting on the contours of the, con- uh, while reflecting on the contours, we think a future social contract might follow. We ignored or peril the opinion of the younger generation who will be asked to live with it. Their adherence is decisive and thus no better. Uh, thus, to better understand what they want, we must not forget to listen. They can't be left in a culture of silence, as it were, as Ferrari would have it. This is all the more significant because the younger generation is likely to be more radical in its demands and the refreshing of our social contract, refashioning of our social contract, sorry. The pandemic has upended their lives and a whole generation across the globe will be defined by economic insecurity and climate anxiety. They will bear these scars forever. Already the millennials, at least in the Western world, are worse off than their parents in terms of earnings, assets, and wealth. They are less likely to own a home or have children than their parents were. Now another generation, Gen Z, is entering a system that it sees as failing and that will be beset by long-standing problems revealed and exacerbated by the pandemic. As a college junior put it, quote, young people have a deep desire for radical change because we see the broken path ahead, end quote. So how will this generation respond by proposing radical solutions and often radical action to prevent issues like social inequalities from worsening or the next disaster like climate change from striking? Uh, the young generations see both as two facets of the same coin, intergenerational inequality. It will most likely demand a radical alternative to the present course because its members are frustrated and dogged by a nagging belief that the current system has failed them and it is fractured beyond repair. As a result, youth activism is increasing worldwide, being revolutionized by social media that fosters mobilization to an extent that it would have been impossible before. It takes many different forms, ranging from non-institutionalized political participation to demonstrations and protests, and addresses inequalities of a mul- in a multifaceted manner. Seeing issues as diverse as income inequalities, climate change, economic reforms, gender equality, and LGBTQ rights as part of a more general inequality problem, the young generation is firmly at the vanguard of social change. There is little doubt that it will be the catalyst for change. Same thing that Ferrari is saying. I wonder where they got these ideas that they were sharing. Same thing. So at this point in the book, Ferrari turns directly to discussing liberation theology by name. The next section, in fact, is called A Theology of Liberation. The rest of the chapter discusses this in terms of spelling it out and then dictating Ferrari's view of the role of the church, in which he identifies three types of churches, which are reactionary or traditional, modernizing, and prophetic. Actually, it's not quite true. It's, it, it's um, Reactionary is both the traditional and the modernizing church. So the traditional church, the modernizing church, and the prophetic church. And we've kind of discussed what that means a little bit. Uh, obviously, he's against these two that are the reactionary church, and he defines those as essentially anything that adopts a conservative theology or upholds the existing system, shrewdly or naively or outright. Um, the modernizing church he accuses specifically of being a huge fraud, pretending to be liberal or, in fact, prophetic, while actually resisting the progress in the same way that this entire chapter has been structured around so far, which is that shrewd versus naive thing. So there's sort of two modernizing churches, the shrewd one and the naive one. The prophetic church is, of course, the one that makes the prophecy of the utopia, that is, it's liberation Marxist. Um, Before diving in more deeply, let's touch on a bit of Ferrarian history so we can understand what we're talking about. I don't know a lot about his religious positions before the 1960s, beyond saying that he was Catholic um, and that he lived in Recife. 
uh, and in fact had met with and been tutored at some ex- to some extent by the famous Red Bishop, Dom Hilder Kamara. Uh, he was definitely left-leaning. Um, but Kamara was influential on Freire at the time, and it may well have been influential in starting his tilt into a bl- more blatantly Marxist view of religion, but also post-colonialism, which was big for Kamara, but then oppression and life. Kamara was called the Red Bishop because he was a communist who spent most of his ministry preaching a very radical theology centered on the oppressed, on the oppressed and poor in the slums of Recife and throughout Brazil uh, and the so-called imperial world. Ferreri was certainly influenced into the liberation theology mold by Kamara, whom he defends by name, as we just heard in this very book in that footnote. In 1964, though, the government of Brazil changed. There was a a revolution, as a matter of fact, and it was done with Freire's radical education program because they saw it as bad and destabilizing and probably communist. They didn't just shut it down, as a matter of fact. He had this prestigious appointment from the previous leader. They actually kicked him out of the country. So he went to Bolivia, and the Bolivian government wasn't going to have it either. In fact, 20 days after he got to Bolivia, they also had an over, uh, their government overturned, and they had a uh, new government come into play that was going to have no, none of this, and they he kicked him out of Bolivia too, so he ends up in Chile in 1964. And there he hooked up with a network of liberation theologian priests um, and studied Marxism fully in depth with them for several years. So what you already have is some post-colonialism and liberation theology and a very leftist bent, then you add in the insult of being kicked out of your position by an overthrow of the government toward something conservative-ish, or maybe worse, uh, Latin American politics have never been quite stable. So you have this kind of background where he's post-colonial, he's liberation theology, he's leftist, he's Catholic, he's now been injured psychologically, emotionally, exiled from his country, great injury, very aggrieved, and this all cobbles in a lot of Marxism on the back of this post-colonial liberation theology back uh, line of thought that he had already established. In 1967, Freire publishes his first book, Education as a Practice of Freedom, and in 68 he wrote Pedagogy of the Oppressed in Portuguese, but he didn't publish it. Um, these two books encapsulated the synthesis of his ideas, especially the Marxist ideas, and especially especially the pedagogy of the oppressed. They put him back on the radar internationally uh, with the help of these leftist priests or Marxist priests, and they got caught up eventually with some priests in America, particularly at Harvard. So in 1968, Ferrari was invited to do a two-year lecture appointment at Harvard. He accepted partly because he was also offered to go to Geneva and work at the World Council of Churches. So he went to Harvard for six months, but at the same time, he committed to going to Geneva at the end of those six months. So in 1969, Ferrari left uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts for Geneva, Switzerland to sit on the World Council of Churches and do research for them. Now, what's the World Council of Churches? The World Council of Churches has been since 1948 dedicated to a so-called liberal ecumenicism. That is the left-wing interfaith project. It was also suspected that during the Cold War, it was infiltrated by communist KGB officers. In fact, if you read the Wikipedia entry, it says explicitly that that happened. Uh, They were posing as Russian and Eastern Orthodox priests to the point where they actually swayed its policy. And Freire held that appointment in Geneva at the World Council of Churches, which had been infiltrated by communists for 10 years, from 1970, or when he arrived, until 1980. And he lived in Geneva for most of the years that he was in exile from Brazil, though he dipped in and out of the United States during that time. He also, however, worked with Kamara there. And that's where they did most of their substantive time and work together. And probably this chapter was born out of that relationship. So this is kind of an important little point. Of course, in the 70s, he had to go to the U.S. because that's when he met Henry Drew, which changed the course of history in a very bad way. In fact, maybe the worst way. So um, some of you all that are listening to this, especially the pastors out there, will probably know a lot more about the World Council of Churches than I do. Uh, But it's worth having brought that up and mentioned it. Uh, while he was there, of course, of considerable note, he, he worked with Kamara, 
I had told you already, Kamara was brought to Switzerland in 1974 as an honored guest and speaker for the what was called at the time the European Management Forum, which became the World Economic Forum a few years later. And it was the founder, Klaus Schwab, who was moved by him that brought him there specifically. Um, Freire and Kamara collaborated some in Geneva while they were both in Switzerland together. Uh, many of the essays in this book which I mean, the politics of education were actually written while Ferrari was in Geneva in those conditions, and the religious imprint that was that that uh, Kamara had uh, that it left on Ferrari cannot be doubted, given that in this book about education, there's an entire set of chapters just about religion. Um, so, what does this liberation theology tucked away in a book on education look like? That's the point of the next section, and its commitment. This is what it looks like. Liberation theology looks like commitment to Marxism, not mere modernization, uh, which raises questions about the real goals of the people involved. And, and as I said, through the inversion of understanding, it raises a lot of very hard questions that we should all be asking right now about leaders and organizations like the Southern Baptist Convention, the Presbyterian Church of America, and so on, who have taken up with this program. Rick Warren being in Davos and doing what he did in Davos, of course, is one that we've already hit on hard. Um so what is, let's, let's look at what Ferrari says about this. He says, well, many theologians who are today becoming more and more historically involved with the oppressed rightly speak of a political theology of liberation rather than one of, the moderniz than, than one of modernizing development. These theologians can begin to speak to the troubling questions of a generation that chooses revolutionary change rather than the reconciliation of irreconcilables. For example, the idea that there's this terrible hard life and that God is supposed to make it better or something like that. The reconciliation of irreconcilables. Because you see, theologians who understand the Marxist study of history are realizing, Frary's telling us, that they have to speak to and answer the so-called troubling questions of a, quote, generation that chooses revolutionary change rather than the reconciliation of irreconcilables. That's why I wanted to bring up the idea that Ferrari was working in an outfit dedicated to ecumenicism, the reconciliation of irreconcilables across faiths, in fact, what a interesting phenomenon that might have been heavily influenced not just by liberation theologians, but also outright KGB subversion. Ferry says they know very well that only the oppressed, as the social class that has been forbidden to speak, can become the utopians, the prophets, and the messengers of hope, provided that their future is not simply a reformed repetition of the present. Their future is the realization of their liberation, without which they cannot be. Only they can denounce the order that crushes them, transforming that order in praxis. Only they can announce a new world, one that is constantly being recreated and renewed. Did you catch that? They know very well that only the oppressed as a social class that has been forbidden to speak can become the utopians, the prophets, and the messengers of hope. Only the oppressed have a voice that can transform the world. Only them. And the oppressed are defined as that social class which has been forbidden to speak on any terms. That's the woke view. Your truth has been suppressed. You have your own truth. You have to be able to speak it. You have your own knowledges that you obtain through your own ways of knowing. You have to be able to assert them. And by asserting them from a position of consciousness, you will denounce the existing world and all of its dehumanizing forms and announce the arrival of a new world. This is a fundamental Gnosticism by oppression. And what Ferrari is saying is that it has to retool so-called authentic faith. Historically speaking, as Giroux explained in the introduction that we read from earlier, the time when these essays were being written or, uh, was one of desperation for the Marxist movement. So not the part we read, another part. The Marxist movements were desperate. They were up against despair. They were seeking hope and found it in Ferrari, says Drew. They are up against what's called the problem of reproduction, that the society and all of its forms and all of the things it does, but particularly its educational forms, reproduces itself. So they were hitting the wall of the fact that the major institutions of cultural transmission, which would be possibly the institutions of cultural transformation if they were controlled by Marxists, so especially education and faith, are actually stabilizing forces that mostly create cultural repetition and reproduction. This is a major impediment to revolution, so the neo-Marxists 
were frustrated. The essay on liberation did not bear out, but it did indicate that those things would have to be changed fundamentally with new sensibilities coming out from within. And it's in this context that Freire is indicating that, the the that theology itself has to be retooled alongside education. That's really the point of this chapter. He says, that is why their hope rests not in an invitation to halt the pilgrimage, an invitation offered not only by the traditionalists, but also by the alienating modernizers. Their hope lies in the call forward march, not in the senseless wanderings of those who give up and run, but the forward march of those who hold history in their hands, who create it and recreate it themselves. Sorry, who create it and recreate themselves in it. It is the forward march they will eventually have to embark upon if they are to experience death as an oppressed class and be born again to liberation. We must stress yet again that this journey cannot be made within their consciousness. It must be made in history. No one can make such a journey simply in the inside of his being. In other words, you have to be an activist. Only progress will do forward march. History must be made. It's not enough to change yourself. You can only begin there. You have to change the world. The oppressed class itself has to change the world and then die and be born in liberation, just like you read in George Lukács that the last battle, the last thing to be overcome, he says, in fact, will be the class consciousness itself. So this is an appeal to the struggle documented in Lukács' 1923 History and Class Consciousness, chapter 3, as a matter of fact, where he talks about class consciousness. There he's wrestling out an apparent contradiction that was left open by Marx. Marx indicates throughout his writing that awakening to class consciousness is necessary for the proletariat to organize, to seize the means of production, and then to direct the course of history. That's your forward march. So that the people can be, that's the point. In the end, though, Marx indicates that the proletariat must transcend private property altogether. And in fact, class identity, remember communism, is a stateless, classless society. So it must identify as a class and then transcend class. That's a contradiction. Lukács is struggling with this in this book, in this chapter, and encapsulates the issue by pointing out that the proletariat has to adopt consciousness as a class to change history. So as a class being key, and it's a, as a strategy, for Freire, it's the oppressed class, the people who are forbidden to speak, but you only do that um, so that you can change the world and then give it up. So the, the fundamental contradiction for Lukács is that in adopting a class consciousness, they fail to transcend class consciousness and thus reproduce class society in a new form when they take over power. And so Lukács concludes that the great challenge is that the proletariat's final boss battle, if you will, is against itself. It's not against the bourgeois, it's against itself. They defeat the bourgeoisie, and then they must defeat themselves. This is going to get turned super wacky Christian under Ferrari with his Easter death and rebirth thing. So Ferrari wrestles with this theme too then, many times throughout this book. It's the basis for the whole Easter thing. It's a basis for what's called a perpetual cultural revolution, where critical consciousness begets revolution and immediately demands more critical consciousness and another revolution. Denounce whatever it is, and when you have something new, denounce that too. We've already mentioned that. But here's how Lukács puts it in terms of defeating the, the working class or the proletariat must defeat itself. He says, this is George Lukács in history and class consciousness. Thus, we must never overlook the distance that separates the consciousness of even the most revolutionary worker from the authentic class consciousness of the proletariat. But even this situation can be explained on the basis of the Marxist theory of class struggle and class consciousness. This entire sentence is in italics. The proletariat only perfects itself by annihilating and transcending itself, by creating the classless society through the successful conclusion of its own class struggle. Now, since we're doing our kind of a church-related or Christian-related uh, episode, let me just take out the word proletariat and say, put in Jesus or Messiah. The Messiah only perfects itself by annihilating and transcending itself. Or maybe God. God only perfects itself by annihilating and transcending itself. Mm -hmm. The struggle, Lukács says, for the society in which the dictatorship of the proletariat is merely a phase is not just a battle waged against an external enemy, the bourgeoisie. It is the struggle of the proletariat in italics against itself, against the devastating and degrading effects of the capitalist system upon its class consciousness. The proletariat will only have won the real victory when it has overcome these effects within itself. Remember that the 
creation of the capitalist system, the creation of exploitation, the creation of specifically the division of labor is in the Marxist theology the fall of man. The proletariat has the job of stepping into that fall of man consciously and sacrificing itself so that we can be made free from it. And that will be the real victory. This is just an inversion of Christianity. This is a religion. But this is also the essential battle that Ferrari is hoping to overcome with his constant education for conscientization and his theology of liberation that he's describing in this book, which is a religion. Ferrari is about to point out, in fact, that thinking about this issue in terms of the secular or Christian is actually the wrong way to think about it. Later, he's going to say it doesn't matter if you're Protestant or Catholic, and that's why they're winning. They have teaming up for revolution, and you have squabbling over theology. For him, there's only one variable, which is being on the side of the oppressed. That is, you're either a neo-communist or you're not. And that's what actually commits you to a theology of liberation. There is no other detail. doesn't matter if it's Catholic, doesn't matter if it's Protestant, doesn't matter if it's math or history or reading in, in, in a secular school. He says, but there are a growing number of people who, whether or not they still claim to be Christians, commit themselves to the liberation of the dominated classes, see whether or not they claim to be Christians. Their experience teaches them that being Christian doesn't necessarily imply being reactionary, just as being revolutionary doesn't always imply being demonic. Interesting wording. Being revolutionary implies struggling against oppression and exploitation for the liberation and freedom of the oppressed, concretely and not idealistically. In their new apprenticeship, they finally realize that it is not sufficient to give lip service to the idea that men and women are human beings if nothing is done objectively to help them experience what it means to be persons. So after discussing how difficult it will be for those who commit to this path because so many will be against them because of freaking communists, um, Freire reiterates the need for the commitment. And what happens here starts getting pretty intense. He says, I cannot permit myself to be a mere spectator. On the contrary, I must demand my place in the process of change. So, uh, so the dramatic tension between the past and the future, death and life, being and non-being, is no longer a kind of dead end for me. I can see, I, I can see it for what it really is, a permanent challenge to which I must respond. And my response can be none other than my historical praxis, in other words, revolutionary praxis. The revolution does not do away with the dramatic tension of our existence. It resolves the antagonistic contradictions that make that tension even more dramatic. But precisely because it participates in that tension as it is as permanent as the tension itself. So first you have to commit yourself to being a revolutionary. And this is the ultimate existential and spiritual battle that cannot be set aside or ignored. In fact, people must demand their place on the side of change, which is they must demand that they get to be an active Marxist and do activism for Marxism. There's your duties of conscience. And revolution is actually the permanent state of being in the world because the world isn't static. Because Hegel's God is a God that becomes, not a God that is. The world isn't static in Hegel's theology, which Marx appropriated. It is a dynamic, dialectical, unfolding world in which the unfolding of the idea through the activity of man causes God to become what God is. The absolute becomes through the process of the dialectic of creation. A reign of undisturbed peace is unthinkable in history, Ferrari tells us, because then the dialectic's not moving. History, he says, is becoming. It is a human event. Humans move the dialectic. But rather than feeling disappointed and frightened by critical discovery of the tension in which my humanity places me, I discover in that tension the joy of being. So Ferrari is saying that joy and hope lie in revolution because it means the contradictions and forms of oppression in this phase of history are coming to an end and taking on new forms. It's like the hope of going to heaven, but you're making heaven, but you don't get to heaven, so you're taking joy in the transitioning the world toward heaven. Kind of like you don't ever become a woman if you're transing, you just take joy in doing whatever it is that the transition process does to your body, apparently. Just like with the trans phenomenon, you're never, you're never a woman. You're becoming a woman. You never become one. You're becoming one. But here, history never finishes. It is becoming. History is becoming, and you should have joy in taking part in the becoming or the unfolding of history. Haven't you heard the good news? History itself is constantly dying and being reborn. 
just like the oppressed, just like you, and you can be a part of it. You can be a transformer of history, a conscious agent. You can be part of the solution. But don't focus on yourself too much, because the way we become is through moving collectively. The I becomes through the we, if you recall, where he said that in previous parts of the book. What was it that the I is fulfilled in the we or something like that? Let me see if I can find that very quickly for you so I can read it because these things fall apart so much. The process of knowing, he says, and since it is always a process, knowing presumes a dialectical situation, not strictly an I think, but a we think. It is not the I think that constitutes the we think, but rather the we think that makes it possible for me to think. See, this is a collectivist endeavor. I think he says it further down a little bit more uh, clearly, but I'm not going to dig through and get distracted further. So the I think is fulfilled and the we think. It's collectivist. So don't get too individualist in that. Individualism is bad. It is the problem. And that's what Ferrari warns us here about. He says, at the same time, dramatic tension cannot be reduced to my own existential experience. I cannot, of course, deny the singularity and uniqueness of my existence, but that does not make my existence in itself isolated from other existences, a model of absolute meaning. On the contrary, if it is the intersubject, it is in the, in the intersubjectivity, meaning the subject, you're a subject, I'm a subject, and there's intersubjectivity between us and between everybody else. That is social phenomenon is where it is. On the contrary, it is in the intersubjectivity mediated by objectivity. In other words, our mutual understanding of the world is mediated by the objective world that we see. We, we make sense of, we create our intersubjectivity through examining the, uh, the, what we see as the objective world. And for Marxists, the objective world is the objective structural conditions of the world. So on the contrary, it is in the intersubjectivity mediated by objectivity that my existence makes sense. I exist does not be, does not come before we exist, but is fulfilled in it. I knew the words fulfilled were somewhere. It's in this chapter, in the next part of my notes. I exist does not come before we exist, but is fulfilled in it. The individualistic bourgeois concept of existence cannot grasp the true social and historical basis of human existence. It is of the essence of humanity. The men and women create their own existence in a creative act that is always social and historical, even while having its specific personal dimensions. You have to sub submit yourself to the social, to the socialist, to the communist view. Now, the Let's be very, very clear here about just how heretical this is, okay? In Christianity, it is all about your personal individual relationship with God and with Christ to determine what your faith is going to be through grace. It is not about the collective. What every other person on earth, Christian or non-Christian, does has nothing to do with your relationship or your salvation, it is your relationship with God as an individual that God is having a relationship with you through Christ. But here, Ferry is not saying that. I exist does not come before we exist, but is fulfilled in it. It is the intersubjectivity that makes my existence make sense, is what he says. And so now it is as the group, the true social basis of human existence by which we're saved. We're saved as a group or we're not saved at all. And everybody who's going to mess it up has to be gotten rid of so the group can be saved. That's why it kills hundreds of millions of people. So just like for Marx, who wanted to make the social man who lives in the social society, for Ferrari, I exist is fulfilled and we exist. And this is what it means to be truly reborn on the side of the oppressed or in Mao's China uh, to adopt the Renmin Li Chang, which is the people's standpoint. Renmin Li Chang. Okay. So people's standpoint, you have to be reborn on the side of the oppressed. That's what he keeps saying. I exist is fulfilled and we exist. It's not your relationship with the Christ that saves you. It is man's relationship with the proxy of Christ on earth, which is the state. Hegel said that the state is the divine idea that exists on earth, which will self-sacrifice or with the proletariat, with the class, which in the end, according to Lukács, will sacrifice itself. The class becomes the, the Messiah that will sacrifice itself in the end, or the state as its um, dictatorship that it installs to move history as its demiurge, if you will, that thing is going to sacrifice it in the end. So it's your uh, commitment to the class 
where it would almost be that all Christians are saved or lost together. So you have to force everybody to believe exactly the same thing. That would be the idea. That's what he's going at. That's what his liberation theology is about. This is a blatant heresy against Christianity, where the relationship is each individual with God, according to the terms that God has set and the free will of human, if you're not a Calvinist, has decided that you can uh, that you can choose or not choose. That's the theology. That's the deal. This is something different. You must subsume yourself to the class, which will be the the mediator of salvation, in other words, the classes or the or the state, depending on which way you want to frame it, is the thing that will uh, self-sacrifice to end human self-estrangement and thus create liberation and emancipation or salvation, if you will. So this rounds out his big point about what a theology of liberation is about then. That's this section. It means siding with the oppressed and adopting a revolutionary commitment so that you become class-oriented with an understanding that the class in the end is going to destroy and denounce itself, a self-sacrificial um, you, but not you specifically, you as in the you that's part of the we, is going to be the Christ that's going to have to die and be resurrected. And you do that by personally dying and being resurrected on the side of the oppressed, which is to say thinking of yourself in terms of that class thinking. Does that make sense? You die as an individual, you're reborn as part of a class with class consciousness. And then that in the end, that because the dialectic will progress, it spirals up, it spirals down, that class will sacrifice itself and then we'll have true liberation. So the individual sacrifices itself to the class and then the class sacrifices itself to liberation. That's how it's laid out. That's a theology of liberation. That's a heresy. Woke can't come into your church, guys. And if you're a pastor, everybody who starts thinking this way has adopted a evil heresy and is going to hell. So you might want to work on making sure that doesn't happen and saving these people who are not just lost, they've been stolen, they're deceived, with a D, with a capital D, I should say. So in light of the fact that uh, Ferry was probably just writing this during or after his appointment in the World Council of Churches, uh, let's take one further look uh, this section to, for amusement's sake to kind of understand what we're dealing with. He says, existence is not despair, but risk. If I don't exist dangerously, I cannot be. But if my existence is historical, the existential risk is not a simple abstract category. It is also historical. That uh, mean, sorry. That means that to exist is first and foremost to risk oneself, though the form and effectiveness of risk will vary from person to person and from place to place. And here's why it's funny to, to read this, because remember, he's doing this to the World Council of Churches. I do not assume risk in Brazil, as the Swiss assumes it in Geneva, even if we were, are both of one political mind. Our socio-historical reality will condition the form our risk will take. To seek to universalize the form and content of existential risk is an idealistic illusion unacceptable to anyone who thinks dialectically. And so now he's talked about the theology, and now he's going to talk about the role of the churches, which is going to be super communist. So, um, Furry finishes that section with his clear view into the demands of the Marxist dialectical faith. He says dialectical thinking constitutes one of the major challenges to those who follow the option we're talking about here. It is not always easy, even for those who identify with the people, to overcome a petite bourgeois education that is individualistic and intellectual, dichotomizing theory and practice, the transcendent and the mundane, intellectual work and manual work. This trademark shows up constantly in attitudes and behavior patterns which, in which the dominated classes become mere objects of their impatient revolutionism. That's what he says. So what he's saying is that you've been probably brought up in a petite bourgeois education system that is individualistic and intellectual. And what does that do? Well, it dichotomizes theory and practice. So the theoretical idea and practical idea that Hegel said constitute the two forms of the uh, now self-estranged absolute, the deity that forgot it's a deity until they're brought back together, theory and practice have to be brought back together. And that's praxis, um, which is reflective and adapts itself through continual revolution that and Marx, but it also has a dichotomy, a separation of the transcendent and the mundane. So here we see the hermetic al alchemy 
entirely. So the idea is that we live here in the mundane world, and maybe the spiritual influences have something to do with what happens here on the earth, but the spiritual realm is kind of completely separate. The transcendent realm where heaven, where God is, is not of this world. That's what Jesus said. My kingdom is not of this world. That's what he tells Pilate, right, in the gospel before they kill him. My kingdom is not of this world, the transcendent and the mundane. But in the hermetic religion, the transcendent or the divine is contained within the mundane, and the goal is to use some kind of an alchemical process or criticism, if it's this social theory, to break open the mundane world and free the divine so that it can gather or recollect back together and recollect or remember what it is, which is divine. It's going to separate intellectual work and manual work. Okay, so this is what he's saying, and he picks up by outlining the role of the church in a way that's very similar to what the World Economic Forum said in 2015 and 16 when it anticipated winning everything. said, quote, in trying now to analyze more deeply the role of the church, especially its educational role, remember he thinks of it as a big school, we must return to some of the points made above, first of all, to the fact that it cannot be politically neutral. So what he's saying is that the church is inherently political, just like education, so there's only a church between being evil or being Marxist. This is your typical Manichaean Gnosticism that's kind of inside of this witch's brew of Gnosticism and Hermeticism that Hegel and Marx and Rousseau and these characters kind of formulated in the relevant uh, century, 1760 to 1860 or thereabouts in Europe. He says it cannot avoid making a choice. It can't be neutral, so it cannot avoid making a choice. It is the church, and therefore we in turn cannot discuss the church's role abstractly or metaphysically. So in other words, the only way to understand the church is, quote, concretely. That's a Marxist term or a Hegelian term. So the only way you can understand the church is through a Marxist analysis of power and its effects. This is where when we do a critique of something, we no longer think of it on the regular terms. We import the structural uh, power-based concrete analysis of Marxism. So the church, in fact, cannot even be understood theologically, according to Freire. Theology itself, it's abstract and metaphysical. So here's where we see, for example, the Southern Baptist Convention, the Presbyterian Church of America, and so on. Here's where we see their push to reinterpret scripture and the gospel, the gospel coalition, for example, has been doing this for a while, and theology itself through a pedagogy of the oppressed. This is why we see Tim Keller, for example, writing the foreword to a book about the critical theory of the Bible that's just recently come out. It's choice, the church's choice. Remember, it has to make a choice because it can't be neutral. This is Freire again. Its choice will condition its whole approach to education, its concepts, objectives, methods, processes, and all of its auxiliary effects. And so now we're going to talk about the seminaries. It is, he says, this conditioning affects the theological training of the leadership of the militant church as well as the education dispensed by the church. Even theological education and reflection are touched. And that's why your seminaries have to use the pedagogy of the oppressed to reinterpret scripture, the gospel, and theology so that they're in line with the so-called concrete Marxist analysis or the Marxist analysis of so-called concrete conditions that people must be conscientized or brainwashed to see. See, the values have to be transvaluated, just like Marcuse said, so that they will be die, so that you will die to your elitism and individualism and be reborn on the side of the oppressed through the personal experience of Easter. So you have to be brainwashed. And it'll be done generatively, of course. So while you have certain people, many of whose names I've mentioned, and I'll come back to them, I'm sure who are bringing this into the church, into the seminaries for this reason, because even theological education and reflection are touched. What are they going to do? How do they make the move? Well, the goal is to bring a little bit of um, Marxist uh, oppression perspective in, because once you get the oppression perspective started, it will basically spiral out of control and take over everything. And the method that Freire uses is the generative themes method. You tool your lesson in terms of a generative theme that will generate emotional responses by picking at people's so-called concrete structural conditions, by finding the things that make them miserable, that they think are unfair, that there's a point of grievance and a scab to pick, and then picking it and using different things from the relevant educational material to do that. If it's reading, for example, maybe you're going to have them read about, I don't know, you know, the mistreatment of Native Americans or something, or you're going to have them read Howard Zinn's take on Christopher Columbus, or if it's, um, 
that would be more of history, I guess. If it was in mathematics, you're going to have them analyze statistics to do with, with race and poverty or something like this to generate the conversation. Maybe you're going to, as the Drag Queen Story Hour paper indicates, Drag Pedagogy is the title of that paper. You can look it up. So you're going to bring a drag queen in to generate questions about why men might dress as women and whether we have to dress as certain ways or whatever, or why we can't gender bend or gender queer or in the parlance, this is a real term, go type it into your search and then find out, gender fucking, they call it, because you're fucking with gender. That's their words, not mine. These are all generative things. They're there to raise the question, to start the dialogue, and to force the dialogue to take place on critical consciousness terms, to conscientize. Freire doesn't stutter throughout this book. We've read the whole book. I'm not going to do it again. So what does it look like in church? Well, maybe they'll say that David raped Bathsheba. Maybe they'll say Jesus died to emancipate people from racism specifically. Maybe they'll say Jesus was a dialectical figure of history, a transformative figure. Maybe they won't say those things, but we know that they have said those things. Uh, and they'll say, maybe those things aren't true, but we need to have the conversation. As a matter of fact, we don't need to just have the conversation. We need to have that conversation. So not because it might be true or false. Remember, Michel Foucault said that whether things are true or false doesn't matter. Freire said that the lessons are, in fact, not knowledge, but a mediator to political knowledge. Okay, so the point isn't to have the conversation about whether David raped Bathsheba so that you can conclude exegetically or whatever that that's the way that that event should be understood. What you need to do is you need to come to learn to understand it from the perspective of people who might read it that way, people who might feel that way when they read it. You need to understand their feelings. You need to understand why somebody might see it that way. You need to understand it from the perspective of the oppressed, from the standpoint of the oppressed, from the standpoint of the people. If it moves your heart and you convert to their heresy, that's great. There's an Easter waiting for you. It must be existentially experienced. Then you'll know that the church has a fake Easter. You can die to the world of oppression and be resurrected on the side of the oppressed if it moves you. But if it doesn't, it doesn't matter. The point is to have that conversation and specifically to understand from the perspective of people who would see it that way. It's not whether or not David raped Bathsheba. It's you need to understand a woman like Rachel Den Hollander who will say that I understand it this way because of things I've went through. And if you understood how I feel, you'd see why I see it that way. You need, to, you need to let in some of that emotional experience. The Logos needs to let in a little pathos and learn to be a little bit more compassionate. Show a little bit of empathy. Perspective taking is going to be necessary. You need to get into the standpoint, right or wrong. You need to understand why somebody who has been oppressed or has been victimized might see things that way because you must see from the standpoint of the, the oppressed. That's what it's about. That's the generative method. It all starts with understanding why somebody would see the aspects of their concrete lived experiences where you can't or you won't, and opening up to that perspective, a new perspective on David and Bathsheba and the nature of sexual assault, the experience of it, the horror of it, what people experience in church that reminds them of it, etc., a new perspective on race and theology, a kingdom race theology maybe, who knows, a new perspective on the role of Jesus, and now you're a liberation theologian. He was a dialectical figure of history. And to get there, the seminaries have to teach pastors to see it this way. Not that many, but some. So as from Freire, they'll, as we see from Freire, uh, they go on to orient the churches in the right way, because this is what theologies do. They pick a lodestar, and they orient all philosophy, all theology, toward that lodestar. That lodestar is called its concept of divinity. The concept of divinity in the Marxist theology is being a transformative subject in the world that creates the kingdom of God here on earth through believing in or having faith in other human beings and necessity of permanent struggle. Permanent activism. Permanent activism that uses Marxist theory. In other words, historical praxis. They keep saying the words over and over again. Please, please learn what they mean. They aren't saying word salad. And so Freire offers three options churches can take, which is traditional, modernizing, and prophetic. And the first two of those, traditional and modernizing, he sees as reactionary, as preventing the prophetic church. So they are openly counter-revolutionary, 
counter-revolutionary while pretending not to be, and Marxist. Those are your three options. So the first, which is openly resisting, has to be relentlessly attacked. The second, which is pretending, has to have the thumb screws continually tightened on it while they continue to run interference for the Marxists. Right, Russell Moore? Right, Mark Dever? Right? Right, Tim Keller? And then the Marxist ones go to town. And there's your Pope Francis, I guess. So, as Ferrari says, in a class society, the power elite necessarily determines what education will be and therefore its objectives. The objectives will certainly not be opposed to the elite's interests. As we have already said, it would be supremely naive to imagine that the elite would in any way promote or accept an education that stimulated the oppressed to discover the raison d'etre, I can't say French things, raison d'etre, the reason for being, of the social structure. These churches, which are freezing to death in the warm bosom of the bourgeoisie, can only, or sorry, can certainly not tolerate any ideas, even if only verbal, that the, the elite considers diabolic. And yet again, the iron law of woke projection never misses. Remember, diabolic means communism when they bring this up. Uh, but more importantly, what they are never telling you how power actually works. They're telling you how they believe power works, which means they're telling you how they will abuse power when they get it, because it's how their crackpot religion believes power works, and they don't know any other way. Utopianism for woke critical Marxists is just an endless commitment to denouncing those new abuses later. You denounce whatever is. That's utopian consciousness for Freire. So they create a new thing. They do a bunch of abuses. You, you denounce those later, and you do it in some bogus way that just makes things worse and worse and blame somebody else for them. It was the system. I got monkeypox because the system didn't take care of me well enough. Blah, blah, blah. Our task, Freire says, in considering the role of the church in education would be simplified if we could count on coherence between church and gospel. In that case, it would be sufficient to look at the dependent condition of Latin American society, with the exception of Cuba and up to a point Nicaragua, and set up a strategy of action for the church. The reality, however, is different. We cannot think in a vacuum. So pause to notice for a second that he's just asserting that if people really understood the gospel as a dialectical text, Jesus as a transformational figure of history, with the real God being the God of history, the true supreme being being the God of history, that's unfolding the absolute idea that's unfolding history to its logical omega point, which is the kingdom of God being built here on earth for the oppressed. If people just really understood the gospel, that's what Ferrari is saying, the tasks of communism would be straightforward. And this is how a Gnostic heresy happens. It asserts a particular concept of the scripture into the scripture and then calls everything else naive, blind, reactionary, or heretical because of the iron law of woke projection. But for them, because they believe they have the secret absolute knowledge, the so-called gnosis. That's why it's called Gnosticism. And so let me pause for a second to tell you, there are people out there, lots of them, who still think you can bring in a little critical race theory or critical feminism or gender and queer theory into the theological interpretation as a so-called analytical tool, even funnier, subordinate to scripture, as it said in Resolution 9 the Southern Baptist Convention in 2019. Subordinate to scripture. This doesn't stay subordinate. It will subordinate scripture. So what, what they're saying, though, there's a lot of people who believe this. Well, we can bring in a little. We have to take on the perspective. We got to hear them out. We got to listen. We got to find a third way. Because a little heresy is apparently okay. But let me tell you right now, Gnosticism once invited in never, ever, ever stays there. It always expands, and it always eventually takes over. And once you let it in, you have to realize it's like with a vampire. If a vampire bites you, one of two things happens according to the legend. Either you turn and become a vampire yourself, good for the vampire teams, or you die. They don't care. So if they take over your church or your convention, either it becomes a Marxist organization that promotes Marxism and raises consciousness, good for them, they get a new institution operating for them and devoting its resources to their project, or it dies, which is great because something that was resisting them is out of the way. They don't care which one it is. Now, the greatest barrier to this heresy is the so-called traditional church, which, which Ferrari tries to burn as reactionary, and that he tries to position as being backwards and something that can only exist in a pre pre-industrial or pre-modern society. But the fact is that it's tradition that's the problem. Tradition keeps heresy out. 
firm adherence to traditional ways of belief and life keep the Gnostic heresy out? And this gets a little heavy duty. He says, it is not possible to speak objectively of the educational role of the various denominations as being unified and coherent. On the contrary, the roles differ, sometimes opposing each other according to the political line, whether evident, hidden, or disguised, which the different churches are living out in history. The traditionalist church, first of all, is still intensely colonialist. He doesn't even hesitate to just blast it with colonialism. right? Now, a subtle point not to lose is that he keeps saying in history, in history, in history. Every time he says that is he's asserting that all churches, whether they think they do or not, whether they want to or not, fall into the dialectical conception of the world and the people that live in that world. He's asserting the Marxist theology into it. This is actually a deep assumption that lies under everything that we're talking about. Every single podcast, etc., talk, essay that I've put out about this is about the same thing. The books, same thing. When you hear in history from a Marxist, it means they are asserting the theological construction, uh, construction of Marxism into whatever they're talking about. So when he says the different churches are living out in history, he's saying they're all, Mar- they're all in the Marxist context whether they want to be or not. They might deny it, they might ignore it, but they are still in that context. And they can't help it. So when they are intensely colonialist, when they resist going Marxist or prophetic, they're taking a decisive action to hinder the progress of history, which makes them evil from that religion. And that's why he starts off by saying they are intensely colonialist, because colonialism means oppressive, problematic, evil, fundamentally evil. Bruce Gilley, a professor at Portland State, wrote a paper in defense of colonialism, citing scholars from Africa saying, well, look at what it's actually done. Yes, there were horrors. Yes, it was terrible. But look at the economic and the societal gains that the post-colonial nations have. You can't say that. They tried to take. They they not only retracted the paper. They get issued death threats against the editor of the journal that accepted the paper, a peer-reviewed academic paper. They tried to take Gilly's PhD away from him and get his get him fired from his job. He ended up getting brought up on Title IX, which is sex discrimination charges at Portland State University over this, which I don't know how that logic works, but it was a powerful cudgel that they had to hit him with. They went bonkers. I mean, literally death threats against the journal editor until he retracted the paper. But the traditional church, he says, is a missionary church in the worst sense of the word, a necrophiliac winner of souls, a death cult winner of souls, a death-loving winner of souls. Hence its taste for masochistic emphasis on sin, hellfire, and eternal damnation. Ferry's literally saying that traditional churches, maybe like yours, are a masochistic death cult. He's literally saying it's not said, it's not the first time he said it. The mundane, he says, the mundane dichotomized from the transcendental is the filth in which humans have to pay for their sins. Now we're looking at, you know, the story in Genesis 3 where Eve eats the fruit, God kicks him out of the garden, and then by the sweat of your brow, all this stuff, you know, the hard part of life, the mundane, you've been kicked out into the mundane world, out of the garden, it's been dichotomized from the transcendental. And that's the filth in which humans have to pay for their sins. And so, hey, Calvinists, now we're talking about you, right? Everybody is wholly depraved, um, totally depraved, I understand, sorry. And so you have to pay for your sins in a state of total depravity in a world full of pain and suffering and evil, blah, 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 because the mundane has been dichotomized from the transcendental. And he's saying that that is why you are a masochistic death cult as a church. Um, but a subtle, subtle point to remind you of here is that when he's talking about this dichotomization of mundane and transcendent, as we said before, is alchemy. To remind you, what is hermetic alchemy? Is that the divine is contained within and being freed from the domain or from the mundane by the dialectical work of conscious humans who understand the magic. That's what humans were created to do, but they can only do it when they understand how the alchemical magic works, how the dialectic progresses. In other words, they have to be conscientized, and that's what makes them not mere animals. And that's the existential scream we hear all through Marx and all through Freire reading uh, reading these books. The more they suffer, this is you guys in the traditional church that are your death cult, your masochistic death cult. This is Freire describing it. The more they suffer, the more they purify themselves, finally reaching heaven and eternal rest. Work is not for them the action of men and women on the world, transforming and recreating, but rather the price that must be paid for being human. That's the standard interpretation of Genesis 3, yes. Work here, though, really for him, the action of men and women on the world, is the work of transforming the world into a Marxist kingdom of God, 
and he thinks that the religious, the traditional churches, are getting it completely wrong. It's also the work on man to transform man himself into the deity that will live in the Edenic commune that they hope to establish at the end of history that technically never arrives because you're always in transition, just like the trans people never finish. They're always in transition. And then that's the hope and joy is that you get to be part of the transitioning process that never ends and clearly does great things for the health of, the, say, the body or the society or the state or whatever that happens to be in a nation, the people. In this traditionalist line, he says, whether it be Protestant or Catholic, we find that we find what the Swiss sociologist Christian Lalive calls the haven of the masses, which is obviously poking back to Marx's opium of the masses. We already read a little bit from that. This view of the world of life, Freire tells us, satisfies the fatalistic and frightened consciousness of the oppressed at a certain moment of their historical experience. They find in it a kind of healing for their existential fatigue. So it is that the more the masses are drowned in their culture of silence with all of the violence that this implies on the part of the oppressors, the more the masses tend to take refuge in the churches that offer that sort of ministry. Submerged in this culture of silence where the only voice to be heard is that of the ruling classes, they see this church as a sort of womb in which they can hide from an aggressive society. In despising this world as a world of sin, vice, and impurity, they are in one sense taking their revenge on their oppressors its owners. So you hate yourself and you're getting revenge on God by wallowing in that, apparently. And again, like I said, let's just look back at that opium of the masses thing. We'll just do the um, one paragraph. Religious suffering is, at one and the same time, the expression of real suffering and a protest against real suffering. This is Karl Marx, by the way. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of the heartless world, and the soul of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people, and that's what we're kind of appealing to here. Um, but he's also saying that by by believing in things like total depravity, that you are uh, being masochistic against yourself. You're despising the world. The Iron Law Woke projection for the Gnostic is strong, and thus taking revenge on the oppressors. Now, pause for a second. Just imagine. He's trying to say that the faithful, God-fearing people despise the world as a world of sin, vice, and impurity, and are therefore taking revenge on God. As a Marxist, he's saying that. I mean, this is totally Gnostic, totally projection. The Iron Law of Oak projection hits so hard here that it's crazy. Literally, there's, by definition, is a religion of hatred, envy, and revenge against the character they that, that is called God that they believe is the demiurge that's an evil thing that's separate that, that's responsible for creation but also antagonistic to what's truly divine to the true supreme being their view their entire theology is built around the idea of the insult and injury of being flung in the Heideggerian sense into unwanted existence the so-called flungness that gave orphan height of being that or the thrownness of being that Heidegger talks about he's a Gnostic by the way Theirs is literally a religion of hatred and envy, a world, a, a religion that sees this world as one of terrible things, of power and domination and oppression. And so they're taking revenge on their oppressors, their, their owners. It's crazy how upside down this is. And this carries on. He says, it's as if they were saying to the bosses, you are powerful, but the world over which your power holds sway is an evil one, and we reject it. He's projecting the Gnostic view onto the traditional churches. This is literally Gnosticism. The difference is that instead of the false god of the old Gnostic heresies, the demiurge, right? In mystery religions, the powerful become the jailers, the constructors of the prison walls, and the oppressors. And the liberated man is his own true divine being that has to be set free but the in communion with everybody else as a we think and as a we exist but now hang on a second here right that means the marxist gnostic heresy holds that the people who have power whether that's the bourgeoisie whether that's the whites whether that's the you know you you name it um the, the normal the straight the Men, depending on whatever the able bodied, the thin, the fit, whatever whatever um, category of, of their neo Marxist identity op oppression that they're in, or the old Marxist economic one, they're saying that those people are the demiurge. 
They created society. They established themselves as the power and principality of that society. They are in charge of that society. They created the mythology that justifies that society and keeps everybody else oppressed as kind of their slaves. So what they're saying is the people in power, white people, rich people, productive class, bourgeoisie, which is mostly the middle class, are the demiurge of society that are evil and that have to be destroyed because they prevent us from getting to reality, to communion with the supreme being, which is in communism, the kingdom of God made on earth. This is the nature. So when you bring in a little, let's just bring in a little critical race theory as an analytical tool, you're bringing in a little Gnostic, Gnostic heresy, a little view that white people are the demiurge that's setting up society to their own advantage at the expense of people of color. That's what you're bringing in. You're literally bringing in a little, Gnostic, a little Gnosticism, using race as a mediator to the Gnostic belief. And here, Frary's literally trying to, literally trying to project that. So the bosses, right? The bosses are the demiurge in the Marxist view of Frary. And his quote here was, it is as if they were saying to the bosses, you are powerful, but the world over which your power holds sway is an evil one and we reject it. They are the Gnostics fighting back against the demiurge. This is a Gnostic faith. How much clearer can it get if you don't get it yet? What do you need? Forbidden, he says, as a subordinate social class to have their say, they fool themselves that the prayers for salvation they voice and their haven are a genuine form of speaking out. None of this resolves the real problems of the oppressed. Their catharsis actually alienates them further, for it directs their anger against the world and not against the social system that's running the world. Thus, seeing the world itself as the antagonist, they attempt the impossible to renounce the world's mediation in their pilgrimage. By doing so, they hope to reach transcendence without passing by way of the mundane. They want meta-history without experiencing history. They want salvation without knowing liberation. Are you paying attention to what this is? Traditional religion is characterized as inducing people to pray to the false demon god, the demiurge, the bosses, and thus to perpetuating their indenture and their servitude while they're thinking that they're petitioning for freedom and healing. This is just damn Gnostic heresy, and I mean damned with like a literal damned. Damned. And the Iron Law of Oak projections all through. The social system becomes the demiurge. Its arbiters, actually, the whites, the rich, the powerful, the privileged, whatever. Privileged is the tool of the demiurge in the modern Gnostic faiths. It's Gnosticism with hermetic alchemy mixed in. Hegel's dialectic theology, scientific Gnosticism, that's going to move the needle. And he says the pain of domination leads them to accept this historical anesthesia. There's your religion, or, or your, uh, he's talking about religion, and there's your uh, reference back, back to Marx's opium of the people thing. Accept this historical anesthesia. It anesthetizes you to the idea that we're in a continual flow of history that must be transformed in the hope that it will strengthen them to fight sin and the devil, leaving untouched all the while the real causes of their oppression. They cannot see beyond their present situation the untested feasibility, the future as a liberation project that they must create for themselves, the kingdom of God they must build for themselves here on earth. And scientific Gnosticism is given as the answer to the project, uh, projection of being a Gnostic heresy, and now he's going to say that it's all for hillbillies and hicks. He says, the traditional type of church is usually found in backwards, closed societies, mostly agricultural, which depend upon the export of raw materials and have only a minimal internal market. Here, the culture of silence is fundamental. Like the archaic social structures, the traditionalist church remains unchanged throughout the modernization of these societies. So he's implying that it's literally backwards not to transform the faith into something more modern or prophetic, which is the correct answer of how to update your church. It's literally backwards. So it's reactionary. The force, he says, of such traditionalist religion is seen even in the urban centers being transformed under the impact of industrialization. Only a qualitative change in the consciousness of the people can overcome the need to see the church as the haven of the masses. Haven of the masses anesthetizes them to history, therefore keeps them from becoming Gnostics. So only going into a Marxist consciousness can transform the church from the rock of the community into a dialectical values weapon for Marxist transformation that's going to be wielded by Klaus Schwab, who knows that values have to be transformed through faith, not intellectual work alone, as we've heard. 
Freire says, and as we have seen, this qualitative change does not happen automatically, mechanically, or merely within consciousness. For all, uh, and so I, I was going to go on, but no, this qualitative change does not happen automatically, mechanically, or merely within consciousness. So no, it happens deliberately by bad men and women selling out the church or the educational system or whatever else to bring it. Uh, to bring in the Marxism, to transform the seminaries, the education, the pastors, the interpretation, the churches, and thus the laity, to gut the churches while keeping them in their external form. That's sublation, that's Alfhaven, that is the transformational project of the dialectical alchemy. It is to change seminaries and churches into centers of conscientization into Marxism. It does not happen automatically, mechanically, or within consciousness. No, it requires praxis. It requires praxis, which means it requires conscious subjects who move the dialectical process forward intentionally as their committed historical praxis. So it requires men like Ed Stetzer, Al Mohler, Rick Warren, Mark Dever, Legan Duncan, Tim Keller, and Pope Francis to deliberately enable this transformation, while in most cases professing to know better. It requires conscious, deliberate praxis by people such as Ed Stetzer, Al Mohler, Rick Warren, Mark Dever, Lincoln Duncan, Tim Keller, and Pope Francis requires it. It does not happen automatically, mechanically, or within consciousness. For all these reasons, he says, Freire says, and for many more that would take too long to analyze, the traditionalist line is unquestionably uh, allied to the ruling classes, whether it or not is it aware of this. The role that these churches can and do play in the field of education is conditioned then by the world, by their view of the world of religion of, and of human beings and their destiny. In other words, you're going to have to see this from a Marxist perspective. Seeing humans as children of God who obey God and work to glorify God and can achieve salvation through grace, through faith, is the problem that has to be replaced by thinking of man as a conscious, transformative subject who is going to build the kingdom of God here on earth in solidarity with the oppressed. That is Marxism. If you don't do that, if you don't take up Marxism, if you obey God or fear God, that would uphold and enable evil because you're not Marxist. Their idea of education, Ferry says, in its application, cannot help being paralyzing, alienating, and alienated. That's, of course, iron law folk protection, but that's how they see you teaching or preaching in the churches, delivering messages, reaching people, and actually transmitting the core of your faith, reaching to them with the actual message, say, of the gospel, instead of Marxism and liberation theology. It is paralyzing, alienating, and alienated they say, see, the world moved on. You've got to catch up, right? We've got to keep up with the world. Only those, he says, who hold this perspective critically rather than naively will be able to escape from their trap through praxis by entering into a totally different commitment to the dominating classes and so becoming truly prophetic. So what Freire is saying here is that the church must be fundamentally transformed into the prophetic church and just one more time, what did Henry Drew say makes it qualify that way? The utopian character of his analysis is concrete in its nature and appeal, and it takes as its starting point collective actors in their various historical settings, and the particularity of their problems and forms of oppression. It is utopian only in the sense that it refuses to surrender to the risks and dangers it face all challenges to dominant power structures. It is prophetic in that it views the kingdom of God as something to be created on earth, but only through a faith in both other human beings and the necessity of permanent struggle. Now, we're going to hear the next, we're going to turn, his next section is on the modernizing church, because it's not going to be enough to modernize. Woke washing, as Klaus Schwab calls it, won't do. You have got to be fully committed. And that's what he says. As we close up this section, he says, furthermore, technological modernization does not necessarily make people more capable of critical analysis because it is it too is not neutral. It is dependent on the ideology that commands it. So making your church more modern depends on whether or not it's critically engaged or not as to whether it counts. So a lot of the ne this next section on both the modernizing church and the, the prophetic one after focuses on 
the context of Latin America. So we're going to skip around a bit. We're going to be sparse on him. But he starts describing the modernizing church and how it emerges this way. He says, some churches abandon the traditionalist perspective for a new attitude. This is under industrialization coming in. History shows that the new position begins to emerge when modernizing elements replace the traditional structures of society. The masses of people, previously almost completely submerged in the historical process, now begin to emerge in response to industrialization. Society also changes. New challenges are presented to the dominating classes, demanding different answers. So in some sense, this is a contextual rewrite of Marx's concept of historical development. Uh, that is, his historicism society comes in and it changes. The serf class and the aristocracy is basically considered as wholly submerged. This is a point Paulo Freire spends a lot of time on. But then as capitalism emerges, they kind of come out of their submersion so they can be awakened to class consciousness and maybe move us toward actual communism and socialism. He spends a lot of time on the submersion idea, particularly in Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And this is... Um, how he says that there, just briefly, he says, submerged in reality, the oppressed cannot perceive clearly the order which serves the interests of the oppressors whose image they have internalized. So the Gnosticism is yet again apparent when we have this submersion idea and the in whose image ver verbiage that we, we just see here, right? So in the interest of the oppression, whose image they have internalized. Man being made in the image of the false god, the demiurge, man being made falsely in the image of the oppressors who set themselves up as gods and set the terms of society. Same thing, same, same, right? So people want to be like their oppressors. They want to go work hard and kick butt at work so they can become a manager too, and they can move up the chain, and maybe one day they can own their own company or their own branch. They want to become like the oppressors. They want to lift themselves up to be like the demiurge, the privileged, the powerful of society and the Marxist religion. They are emblematic of the good life, success, nobility, whether the gods or the bourgeoisie or the whites or whatever. So the envious Marxist believes anyway. And people therefore covet the opportunity to become like them. But God in Gnosticism isn't the absolute. It's God in scare quotes. It's the demiurge. It's a capricious demon who makes the world, but also makes and enslaves people for his own glorification. So when Ferrari's talking about being submerged in reality, that means being kept in a state where you're permanently pre-conscious, okay? Speaking maybe in the text of Genesis 3, that's before any bite of the fruit of the tree of knowledge is taken. That's being submerged. In the Marxist theology, the first bite of that fruit of the tree of knowledge begins consciousness. And the Demiurge didn't like it one bit and threw everybody out and made them suffer. And that's why you're supposed to hate the world, which we just heard. But also in the Marxist theology, it is a second bite of the fruit of the, fruit of the tree of knowledge that gets you back into the garden. You get to become, by gaining absolute knowledge, gnosis, a man who realizes who and what he is, which in this case is a communist. But it's true knowledge of the supreme being, which is not the demiurge demon presented as God in Genesis, the creator of the world, which is merely worldly. So that's the Gnostic faith rearing its head again. The conditions uh, that are described here allow men to first begin to perceive the structural elements of their experience and thus to enter the dialectic as conscious subjects instead of mere tools of false gods they live wrongly in fear of. Okay, so that's what he's saying is that as the modernizing circumstances come along, a, a, a nibble of the bite of the, a nibble of the fruit of the tree of knowledge comes along with it, and people are um, expelled from society. They're made marginal to the society they were originally in. Remember that was chapter six uh, that they are marginalized by the uh, industrial society emerging. And so they are expelled from being at the centers of the community and made marginal. And so their goal is to, they want to work their way to the center by working within the system and becoming the bosses. But Ferrari says is the point is for them to occupy the center, move themselves to the center without becoming bosses by rejecting the existing society entirely, but occupying in a, in a position of resistance and revolution, uh, that center point where they control everything. That's a cultural revolution maneuver. And this is why Ferrer uses this to set up a point about how Marxist sociology exists to justify seizures of power. He says, as we have seen, imperialistic economic interests, such as the need for wider markets, force the national, national elite, which is almost always a purely local expression of a foreign elite, 
to find ways to reform the archaic structures without at the same time frustrating their interests. For imperialism and its national allies, the important thing is that this reformist process, publicly called development, should not affect the basic relationship between the master society and its dependent societies. Development is acceptable, but it must not alter the state of dependence. With the exception of a few minor points that will not alter the state of the subordinate society, the political, economic, and cultural decisions concerning the transformation of the dependent society will be made in the master society. The demands, sorry, this demands that decision making on change must rest in the hands of the masses of oppressed people in the society concerned. It must be independent from the superimposed bourgeois elite. So you have to have a seizure of power. You have to bring the people from the margin back into the center. And the decision-making on change must rest in the hands of the people with the Gnostic perspective. The Gnostics must be empowered to remake the world according to their so-called Gnostic vision, their so-called absolute knowledge. Total disaster every time it happens. Because it turns out most of them are idiots. And almost all of them are mentally unwell, like narcissists. Who else would think that they have secret hidden knowledge about the whole world but crazy people? So he spent several paragraphs now going into the nitty-gritties of how this works in the various strata and movements in Latin America that result uh, that occur uh, uh, as a result of development. One of the things he mentions is populism. Populism emerges, and it's characterized as kind of like a false awakening to consciousness. It's like an antichrist, really, that occurs through partial awakening of the masses. So, by the way, MAGA is antichrist, because MAGA is actually people awakening to a consciousness of that they're being screwed by an order that's being run by the Gnostics. So they position those people as the antichrist. Um, That's what it is. I don't know what the antichrist is in Gnosticism, but uh, they side with the Demiurge, obviously which is the false demon god. And so they support the status quo. And so that MAGA, uh, make America great again, you know, Trump, Antichrist, that's where that mindset comes from because they're populists. So he talks about populism that way because it's a partial but, partial but false awakening of the masses. Um, and this, by the way, is the birth of the masses. The masses are the people from whom the proletariat will emerge. Uh, and Ferreri pulls this back and ties it to the modernizing church. He says... We have seen that the modernization process of the dependent society never gets translated into fundamental changes in the relationship between the dependent society and the master society, and that the emergence of the masses does not by itself constitute their critical consciousness. In the same way, it is interesting to note the church's pilgrimage toward modernization never gets translated into historical involvement with the oppressed people in any real sense that leads toward the people's liberation. So the modernizing church, he says in his own words, is a do-gooder and easily manipulated, but it never actually becomes conscious, which is to say Marxist. It partially awakens and thus becomes do-gooder and manipulable, but it can't engender liberation because it didn't come to consciousness, which is only possible from consciousness. It's only partly conscious and it's not critical, in other words, Marxist, and it is choosing a path that won't lend itself to conscientization, which makes it bad. In fact, the Antichrist. Um, this is MAGA, like I said. Psst, MAGA is this kind of consciousness. It is actual real class consciousness, which Marxists have inverted and turned into anti consciousness. It wants freedom. It's not particularly good at solidarity. Uh, the scary part is that fascism tends to fill in this vacuum. Uh, speaking in broad strokes, and this is a thing we've all need to be paying attention to right now because fascism will be on the rise, is on the rise, as a matter of fact, in reaction to the provocation that is not being answered by people of principle and people with, as my friend Michael Fallon says, people with chests standing up and saying, no, we're going to do right and we're going to stay righteous and we're not going to pick up with evil to fight back against this. Freire says, challenged by the increased efficiency of a society that is modernizing its archaic structures, the modernizing church improves its bureaucracy so that it can be more efficient in its social activities, its do-goodism, and in its pastoral activities. It replaces empirical means by technical processes. I think we're talking about megachurches now. Its former charity centers, uh, its former charity centers directed by laypersons in the Catholic Church by the Daughters of Mary, become known as community centers directed by social workers. And the men and women who were previously known by their own names are today numbers in a card index. So 
yeah, I get it. If you have a mega church and you have a 30,000 congregants, you probably don't know every congregant by name as a head pastor. It's a lot of people. You probably can't remember 30,000 people by name. So you become uh, numbers in a card index or something like that. And so it's not got that traditional small town church feel. It's not the same community. But of course, the Iron Law woke projection never misses. And so this is where I remind you about the thing I told you before from the uh, CASEL, the Collaborative for Academic and Social Emotional Learning, and their so-called communities of practice model that's being promulgated there um, to build what amount to social emotional learning community churches that will make sure that everything in the vicinity of every child is social emotional learning equipped. Just to kind of point that out, we can see what they're really doing here. But back to Ferrer, he says, mass media, which are actually media for issuing communiques to the masses, become an irresistible attraction to the churches, to the modernizing churches. So they're, again, we're talking about like uh, mega churches here. But the Mar- what he's saying is that the Marxists see your church, especially if it's a big one, as a media platform that they can, of course, use to run propaganda campaigns through. So, of course, they're going to give you bogus sermons and woke ideas so that you will run their propaganda for them because that's what you have is a gigantic megaphone that they want access to. They want your flock to hear their message. Churches are a media platform and they can propagandize through any media platform they control. He goes on to say, but the modern and modernizing church can hardly be condemned for attempting to perfect its working tools. What is more serious is the political option that clearly conditions the process of modernization. Like the traditionalist churches, of which they are a new vision, they are not committed to the oppressed but to the power elite. That is why they defend structural reform over the radical transformation of structures. They speak of the humanization of capitalism rather than its total suppression. So Marx said that the positive transcendence of private property and thus human self-estrangement would follow after crude communism, which is roughly the hatred and total suppression of capitalism. Freire is appealing to the total suppression of of capitalism as not even being the goal of the modernizing church. So the modernizing church is modernizing, it's keeping up with society, but it's also impeding both developments. You're not going to get a crude communism or eventually a transcendent communism. And uh, instead, it tries to create what the Marxists would consider an oxymoron, humanized capitalism. In fact, the humanizing education chapter in this book indicates that that's, there's no such thing. Such a thing cannot exist. So humanized capitalism is an oxymoron in the Mar- Marxist faith um, because it would be read as humanized dehumanization, which of course is impossible. And what it really is looking at is that critical Marxists or neo-Marxists see this kind of attempt to update and humanize or soften or control or regulate capitalism as immensely stabilizing, and stabilizing is bad. It's a third way, they would say, but it's still capitalism. In fact, they want really awful capitalism because that creates the contradictions that are so intolerable that socialism will be brought in by revolution. And so things like antitrust law, monopoly law, environmental regulation, etc. Marxists actually, you know, they of course bang on for these things, but those things are actually what created the advanced capitalist situations that stabilized the working and middle class that caused all of this identity politics to have to come up as a solution if you read through Marcusa. And he's saying the modernizing churches create that stabilizing situation and that's bad. The traditionalist churches, he says, alienate the oppressed social classes by encouraging them to view the world as evil. The modernizing churches, so good job, Calvinists. The modernizing churches alienate them in a different way, by defending the reforms that maintain the status quo. That's what I was just saying. By reducing such expressions as humanism and humanization to abstract categories, the modern churches empty them of any real meaning. Because those are Marxist, you have to humanize the world. In other words, make the world fit for humans while making humans fit to live in a world made fit for humans. Such phrases become mere slogans whose only contribution is to serve the reactionary forces. In truth, there is no humanization without liberation. See, there's no humanization without liberation, just as there is no liberation without a revolutionary transformation of the class society. For in the class society, all humanization is impossible. Liberation becomes concrete only when society is changed, not when its structures are simply modernized. So you're listening to what he's saying here. Can you hear it or not? There's the revolutionary way to Marxism, and there's evil. That's all he's giving you. 
Evil can be reactionary or reforming, but both are evil. Good has to be fundamentally transformative and transformational. Reforms are in fact how you go about stabilizing things and increasing false consciousness. Reforming is not adequate. That's why when you are given a list of demands to reform and you reform, the Marxists come back and say that wasn't good enough. You have to kill that too. The church's conservative position, he says, rejected by the young people, just like Klaus Schwab, does not contradict their modernism, for the modernization of which we are talking is eminently conservative, since it reforms in order to preserve the status quo. Hence, the churches give the impression of moving while they are actually standing still. They create the illusion of marching on while really stabilizing themselves. They die because they refuse to die. All right, so here's your message to those folks that I was just talking about a while ago. Russell Moore, listen up guys, J.D. Greer, Beth Moore, maybe Ed Litton, Rachel and Jacob Den Hollander, we listed her first, maybe Al Mohler, lots of these snakes, Dever, Mark Dever, Lincoln Duncan, Matt Hall. These guys are up to one of two things. Either they're doing this and will be destroyed by the revolution that they're enabling, they die because they refuse to die because they're pretending to be conservatives. Or they're playing the middle so that they can get the revolution without it being obvious that that's what they're actually after. At least not for now. So either they are committing treason knowingly and will be rewarded, or they're trying to be a third-way stopgap, in which case the revolution they're enabling is going to destroy them. And at least some of them know enough about this to know the bargain they're making and the game they're playing, which means they're probably not stupid enough to be setting up the conditions of their own destruction. They're not your brothers. These people are not your brothers. They're traitors. But let's let Freire riff on them for a minute so they can ponder, because I'm sure some of them will get to listen to this, because I've named them repeatedly. This is what they think, this is what Freire thinks of these people. This is the kind of church that would still say to Christ today, why leave, Master, if everything here is so beautiful, so good? Their language conceals rather than reveals. It speaks of the poor or of the underprivileged rather than the oppressed. While it sees the alienations of the ruling class and the dominated class on the same level, it ignores the antagonism between them, the result of the system that created them. But if the system alienates both groups, it alienates each in a different way. The rulers are alienated to the degree that, sacrificing their being for a false having, they are drugged with power and so stop being. The dominated, prevented to a certain degree from having, finish with so little power that being is impossible. Because being requires transforming. Turning the work into merchandise, the system creates those who buy it and those who sell it. The error of the naive and the shrewdness of the shrewd is seen in their affirmation that such a contradiction is a purely moral question. So which are these guys? Which Are they naive? Are they shrewd? Which side are they on? I'll let you guys think about it. Now, Freire reiterates Marxist theology, whatever those guys are importing, and this, well, however they're doing it and why. Specifically, he imports the concept that it holds of man, the ontology of man, and the purpose of his religious awakening through conscientization. So he's going to reaffirm the Marxist theology here. He says the ruling classes, as is the logic of the class system, prohibit the dominating classes from being. In this process, the ruling class itself ceases to be. The system itself keeps them from rising above this contradiction, from any movement that would end their alienation as well as that of those they dominate. See, we have to overthrow the system for the good of the oppressors as well as the oppressed. The dominated alone are called to fulfill this task in history. The ruling class as such cannot carry it out. What they can do within their historical limits is to reform and modernize the system according to the new demands the system allows them to perceive, thus in effect maintaining that uh, which results in the alienation of all. So my belief is the thing that Freire is calling the modernizing church is a church that sucks up to power, so that we can guess what's going on with them. On the naive side, their own power and creature comforts, like nice offices, desks, and libraries, maybe a travel teddy bear, very plush, I don't know, and the likes. On the shrewd side, it's dominating power, craven power, which is now the power of the woke regime, would be what you would be sucking up to. 
which they've been told is coming with no hope of stopping it. It's inevitable. There's nothing you can do, but you'll be rewarded if you come along with us. And it will strip those who didn't help of their comforts or legacies and maybe even their teddy bear. Who knows? So unless they're shrewdly operating on the side of the regime, it will spare no love for them or anything they vainly hope to preserve by straddling the middle. Their legacy will be meaningless unless they help the transformation. Their creature comforts will be destroyed unless they help the transformation. Their teddy bear will be taken away and thrown away unless they help the transformation. Freire is clear on what the revolution thinks of them, however useful they might be. Faith is everything to these people. The Marxists, I mean, full faith and commitment, not mere utility. Liberals get the bullet too. You help through the revolution, then they shoot you because you're useless. Freire says under the conditions in which the modernizing church churches act, their concepts of education, its objectives, its application, all must form a coherent unity within the general pract- uh, their general political position. That is why, even though they speak of liberating education, they are conditioned by their vision of liberation as an individual activity that should take place through, the, through a change of consciousness and not through the social and historical praxis of human beings. So they're going to transform each individual rather than transforming the social structures. So they end up by putting the accent on methods that can be considered neutral. Liberating education for the modernizing church is finally reduced to liberating the students from blackboards, static classes, and textbook curricula, and offering them projectors and other audiovisual accessories, more dynamic classes, and a new techno-professional teachers. Or sorry, techno-professional teaching. And that's not going to be sufficient. Modernizers get the bullet too, is how I should have said it. And then Ferrari turns to his real vision, the Marxist church, which he calls the prophetic church, which Drew told us, Henry Drew told us is prophetic because it aims to build a kingdom of God here on earth, but only in solidarity, you know, actually in faith in other human beings, in solidarity with the oppressed, embracing the need for permanent struggle. That's what you're signing up for. Finally, Ferrari says, another kind of church has been taking shape in the third world, though it is not often visible as a coherent totality. It is a church as old as Christianity itself without being traditional, as new as Christianity without being modernizing. Mm-hmm. It's a Gnostic heresy, like the Valentinians, or like Origen. It's as old as Christianity without being traditional or orthodox, and as new as Christianity without merely being modernizing. It's something completely different. It is the prophetic church, Freire says. It is the prophetic church opposed and attacked by both traditionalist and modernizing churches, because it's communist, as well as by the elite of the power structures. The utopian, prophetic, and hope-filled movement rejects do-goodism and palliative reforms in order to commit itself to the dominated social classes and to radical social change. In contrast with the churches considered above, it rejects all static forms of thought. It accepts becoming in order to be, because it's hermetic alchemy. Dialectical becoming is what it accepts, is how it believe, how it operates, how it believes, how it sees the world. In fact, how it characterizes God. It is a heresy. It is a different religion. Because it thinks critically, in other words, in this way, Freire tells us, this prophetic church cannot think of itself as neutral, nor does it try to hide its choice. No kidding, it's Marxist. But about hiding its choice, that's both true and false. It is openly political, that's true. It justifies itself by saying that everything is political, so it has to be political, and it is openly politically political, but it definitely hides the fact that it's Marxist, Marxist and definitely hide the fa- hides the fact that it's Gnostic. It doesn't say the true things about it. It doesn't hide that it's political. It doesn't hide what side it's on, but it doesn't openly say that it's Marxist, and it doesn't openly say that it's a Gnostic heresism, or heresy because we'd shut that right down. Therefore, he says, Freire says, it does not separate worldliness from transcendence. God is in the world and of it. That's what Freire said earlier. You have to be a man in the world and of the world. It does not separate salvation from liberation. So liberation is salvation. It knows what finally counts is not the I am or the I know, the I free myself or the I save myself, nor even the I teach you, I free you, or I save you, but the we are, we know, we save ourselves. It's communist then. Salvation is not through grace, through faith, or even, if it were that way, individual works. 
It's through collectivism and doing the collectivist work to transform man's society and the world at a fundamental level to be communist. That's the prophetic church. As Freire says, this prophetic line can only be understood as an expression of the dramatic and challenging situation of the third world. It emerges when the contradictions in society become apparent. It is at this, like communism, it is at this moment too that revolution is seen as the means of liberation, which is the same as salvation, by the way, for the oppressed people. And the final military coup, sorry, no final, and the military coup as the reactionary counter move. So it's communism as a religion calling its uh, calling itself the churches that it hides within, where it does the precise transvaluation of values, which is um, making values mean something different. In other words, redefining basic words like love, respect, empathy, brotherhood, and so on, needed by itself and by the regime, like the World Economic Forum, to move toward the new world. Faith transmits values. They're not merely intellectual. Klaus Schwab said so. So you know they understand this. Instead, he said, and so Ferrari says, I guess, the world's prophetic Christians may disagree among themselves, especially at the point of action, but they are the ones who have renounced their innocence in order to join the oppressed classes and who remain faithful to their commitment. I told you, they value faith. This is a full-blown religion, and if you're not fully faithful to their Gnostic uh, religion, their dialectical faith, you're screwed. So to speak hermetically, the Prisca Theologia, as it was called, the, the ancient theology, is the dialectical faith. That's how they see it. Dialectical leftists see the dialectical faith as the Prisca Theologia, the one true theology that unifies all theologies, that could take any theology, any science, any school of thought, and bind and orient them to point toward a new lodestar, which is the communist utopia, the communist conception of man and the world. That's what the Marxists believe. Denominations don't matter. Theology doesn't even matter. Because all of that is just a reflection or an approximation of the one true theology, which is the Prisca Theologia, which is the dialectical faith. Everything's just an approximation. Christianity, as it's been practiced so far, it's an approximation. It's a dirty approximation of the dialectical faith. Islam, as it's practiced, is a dirty approximation of the dialectical faith. And what you'll see is that they'll be transformed from within to look like they are from the outside still. It'll still look like Christianity, it'll still look like Islam, still look like Judaism, still look like Buddhism. And they're going to point, they're going to be bound and oriented toward the dialectical lodestar. Because there's one true faith, the Prisca Theologia, the ancient theology, of which all the other theologies, philosophies, and sciences are mere reflections and approximations that don't have it all. They are the divine trapped within a mundane shell, the best humans could do at the moment. And that Prisca Theologia, the dialectical faith, will be dialectically realized so long as they're all oriented correctly toward liberation, toward the theology of the oppressed, and the praxis is done. And Freire says, it doesn't matter. Protestant or Catholic, from the point of view of this prophetic vision, the division is of no importance. Clergy or lay, they've all had to travel hard, a hard route of experience from their idealistic visions toward a dialectical vision of reality. So they don't care about your differences, differences in theology. You do, and that's why you lose. You're fighting about how old you have to be when you're baptized, and they're saying Protestant, Catholic, atheist, preacher, layperson, doesn't matter. Are you oriented toward, toward the oppressed? He's actually listed, religious, not religious, Catholic, Protestant, differences in denomination. From the point of view of this prophetic position, the division is of no importance. Clergy or lay doesn't matter. We're all working for the oppressed. They work together for their higher vision, but you don't because you're squabbling about theology. So they advance and you lose. They serve a new god, the Gnostic god behind the gods, behind the little gods, behind the demiurge that you worship. Theirs is the absolute, the absolute idea, who seems to be Satan, using a more seemly name. If you remember your Lord of the Rings, which is kind of another theology built into it, Sauron took very pleasing forms too until he's finally exposed and could no longer do so, the end of the fall of westernness. But that's neither here nor there. They have learned, Freire says, not only as a result of their praxis with the people, but also from the courageous example of many young people. It's always the young people. It's cultural revolution. They now see that reality, a process, and not a static fact, is full of contradictions. Reality is a process, guys. And it's full of contradictions. And that social conflicts are not metaphysical categories, but rather historical expressions of the confrontation of these contradictions. 
So he's saying, we made the kids Marxist and that's why we're doing what we're doing. And now they're going to force you to change your mind. Klaus Schwab says the same thing in the great narrative for a better future. He says that we're going to try to force it with the corporations. We're going to try to force it with the, with the government, a public private partnership. And if that doesn't work, don't worry. We've already changed the youth and they'll demand it. Any attempt, Freire says, therefore, to solve a conflict without touching the contradictions that have generated it only stifles the conflict and at the same time strengthens the ruling class. And again, this is exactly what Klaus Schwab says about ESG and sustainability in The Great Narrative for a Better Future, as he calls this stupid book. It's The Great Reset Book 2, as I mentioned, I think, before. Let me see if I can find what I'm talking about again, because I want to actually let you hear it. I don't want you to think... We're making these things up, but I have so many things open on my desktop. Oh my gosh. I literally already read from this book and I can't find it again. Okay. He says that the corporate government, public-private partnership, is imposing new values on corporations and society, and the youth are already beginning to demand it, and that's going to get worse. That's why they're so insane, by the way, about control and education and control of education and control of churches. They need that to be true. That's why Rick Warren told Davos what he told him back in 2008, that they need the faith component to push the values, and that uh, that was, would be so that the attempted change wouldn't be resisted. You have to understand what's happening here. So let me find where, he, where Klaus says this in, in here, because it's tagged with ESG, so it's not that hard to find. Um, nowadays, this is a couple paragraphs, business leaders no longer consider the improvement of stakeholder value as an option. Wait a minute. Is that right? Yeah. For all the reasons expanded on in other parts of this book, they know that there is no alternative way forward. It's inevitable. That is a reason why in the coming years, measuring ESG performance will be the gold standard of business adherence to stakeholder value. Many businesses do not have an interest in making the world better. Bad for them. Maybe they're just modernizing, right? And some will be tempted to engage in green or woke washing the modernizing church, but they'll be forced to the modernizing corporation, but they'll be forced to commit to ESG and ultimately to all the commitments. And ultimately all the commitments will be put to the test by government action and societal pressure. Contrary to stakeholder capitalism that always, sorry, contrary to shareholder capitalism that always saw government as the source of all evils, stakeholder capitalism welcomes the idea of a le- of legislative action to define with precision the benchmarks for ESG reporting and performance. There's nothing wrong with governments creating the right incentives and issuing appropriate norms for responsible behavior, particularly when they represent the choice expressed by citizens in free elections. (laughs) This then gives them the authority to determine societal rules. And there's your Romans 13, right? Submit to all authorities. Yeah, don't submit that their authority is fake. In uh, In the same way that companies have an obligation to report their financial results quarterly or annually, depending on the countries and whether they are listed or not, in the not-too-distant future, they will have a similar obligation to report on ESG metrics. Several, several initiatives have already been undertaken to determine the best way to achieve this. Stakeholder capitalism metrics of the World Economic Forum is a major one. They will converge toward a standardized ESG performance metric that works across industries and countries and that is supported by global standard setters. Hmm, global, huh, how about that? Such initiatives tend to be led by business, but a globally accepted term of sustainability reporting will be a concerted effort of businesses, governments, regulators, the official accounting community, and voluntary standard setters. In the end, governments will make the last call for setting the legal legal obligations, targets, and incentives around ESG standards and performance proposal proposed by business. They will also ensure that the stakeholder value or that stakeholder value is comparable or is compatible with a rigorously defined concept of so, uh, societal and planetary value. In parallel, societal pressure and rising activism will accelerate the pace at which companies embrace stakeholder value and will quote force the reluctant ones to convert. To the cause. There is ample evidence. This is really the great narrative book. Klaus Schwab really published this this year. There is ample evidence that consumers increasingly favor products and services from companies that are more ESG compliant. Accordingly, CEOs now consider that adopting sustainable practices is the new price of entry to compete. This trend will amplify as millennials and Gen Z acquire greater prominence in the workforce. The younger generations continually hammer home the truth that they have a majority stake in what the future yields because of environmental degradation, climate change, and rising inequalities. 
will have disproportionate impacts in their lifetime. The latter already represents a major impediment in terms of accessing decent housing. In light of this, business adherence to ESG considerations will become increasing re increasingly relevant to sustainable value creation. The price of not doing so will be will just be too high in terms of the wrath of activists, both social and investors. And he goes on and on. He says this again and again, is that they're going to, and it's many more pages, I'm not going to keep reading it, but this is exactly the point that I'm trying to make. Uh, this is what Klaus Schwab says. There is Freire. Any attempt there, well, let me read the whole part. They have learned not only as a result of their practice with the people, but also from the courageous example of many young people. They now see that reality, a process, and not a static fact, is full of contradictions, and that social conflicts are not metaphysical categories, but rather historical ex expressions of the confrontation of these contradictions. Any attempt, therefore, to solve conflict without touching the contradictions that have generated it only stifles the conflict and at the same time strengthens a ruling class. So that requires consciousness. And as Lukács said, consciousness is educable. You can learn consciousness. In fact, you must learn consciousness, thus the brainwashing, thus the social-emotional learning. The, pro the prophetic position, Freire says, demands a critical analysis of the social structures in which that conflict takes place. This means that it demands of its followers a knowledge of sociopolitical science. Since this science cannot be neutral, this demands an ideological choice. Do you see what's happening here? He's saying we must go along with this Marxist program. That's what allows the utopian possibility of his faith to be believed, that they really can build the kingdom of God here on earth and siding with the oppressed and do it correctly. That's the S in ESG, environmental, social, and governance. Social is social justice. That's this. They think they really can with those that deserve to getting to live in the new world, the kingdom that they're building as gods and knowing themselves to be as gods. Okay, so now we go to another world economic forum darling, the kind of visionary psychopath Yuval Noah Harari that wrote a bunch of books. Okay. So they, their, their faith, their utopian faith, is that you can build the kingdom of God and the people who get to live in it, who are the special elect, that are up with their program. It'll be demanded by everybody, but the elect will get to live there, and they will be as gods and know themselves to be as gods. How do we know this? Because we are homo sapiens, wise men. Or if we believe Adam Smith, in some sense, we're homo economicus, we're economic man. That's what Marx was angry at and sought to destroy in order to rehumanize man, not even as wise man, but in fact as social man, socialist man. But it's phrased by Yuval Noah Harari as, in the title of his second major book, as homo deus, God man. Okay. So the goal is to build the kingdom of God and allow the elect to live in the kingdom of God as gods, knowing that they're gods. Homo Deus. God-man. Not Homo sapiens, not Homo economicus. Those are to be destroyed and replaced by Homo Deus, fully humanized man as God. The absolute man, just like the absolute idea held. So that's another point. Hegel believed in the absolute idea. That's God. It has to be realized by bringing the theoretical and practical ideas back into harmony. Marx said that the idea is, the, the, the Hegel had it upside down, and that's a theology. He actually said that because the idea actually exists in man's head. And so the absolute idea, the analog of the absolute idea would exist in the head of the absolute man, which arrives at the end of history when his theory and praxis are brought back into harmony. Such a prophetic perspective, now that we understand it a little better, says Freire, does not represent an escape into a world of unattainable dreams. It demands a scientific knowledge of the world as it really is, that is, Marxism. For to denounce the present reality and announce its radical transformation into another reality capable of giving birth to a new men and women implies gaining through praxis a new knowledge of reality. Sounds like eugenics to me, but this is the second bite of the fruit of tree of knowledge that's used to create homo deus out of the homo sapiens who we are now. The dominated class, as Freire says, must take part in this denunciation and enunciation. It cannot be done if they are left out of the picture. Why? Because they're the ones, according to Marx, it's the people who suffer from the division in society that have the glimpse 
of the communist gnosis, what Freire called a gnosiological attitude because it's a Gnostic attitude. Freire says this prophetic position is not petite bourgeois because that's what it is. It is well aware that authentic action demands a permanent process, permanent process, that only reaches its maximal point when the dominated class through praxis also becomes prophetic, utopian, and full of hope. In other words, revolutionary. So now you know what critical whiteness studies is about. You have to awaken that vanguard. That's why you have people like Robin D'Angelo going around the country telling white people that they're racist and that they need to be reborn as anti-racists, at which point they will commit to a, ongoing, a lifelong commitment, I should say, to an ongoing process of self-reflection, self-critique, and social activism on behalf of anti-racism. You have to be reborn as an anti-racist. And because you need the bourgeois, you need the demiurge to be transformed into somebody on your side. And the ones that won't can't be re-educated so history tells us, and they go in the ditch. A society in a permanent, uh, sorry, I messed up Freire again. A society in a state of permanent revolution cannot manage without a permanent prophetic vision. Without it, society stagnates and is no longer revolutionary. Okay, so again, what is a theology? A theology is a kind of, it's like a philosophy of philosophies of a particular kind, or a science of sciences. That's how John Henry Newman phrases it in the idea of the university. It takes a bunch of other philosophical positions, ontology, which is a theory of being, axiology, which is a theory of values, um, teleology, which is a theory of purpose, um, epistemology, which is a theory of knowledge, sociology, which is a theory of society, for example, and it binds these things together into one coherent, bigger picture philosophy, and then points them in a single direction toward something it considers divine. That's a theology, okay? So you take many philosophies, bind them together so that they're all kind of operating in the same page or on the same bundle, and then you point them at a single thing considered to be divine. That's a theology at its heart, okay? I want you to really understand that. It takes all of human thought and binds it and orients it in a particular direction that it considers to be the highest good. A society in a state of permanent revolution cannot manage without a permanent prophetic vision. What do you think that permanent, permanent prophetic vision does? It cannot manage. It binds all of the other aspects of human existence and orients them toward a single point that it considers to be the highest good, which is the fundamental transformation of society into the kingdom of God. So in praxis revolutionary praxis, you always have to be denouncing whatever currently is, and you have to believe constantly, you have to have faith that denouncing whatever currently is will lead to making things better. That's critical consciousness, that if you denounce from a position of denouncing dehumanizing, uh, uh, dehumanizing structures, from that will emerge the possibility and the enunciation of a possibility of something better. But liberation, this is permanent liberation is always just over the communist rainbow. So just destroy your society, your church, your family, your education system, your psyche, your whatever, just destroy it and destroy it a little bit more and destroy it a little bit more. You're almost there. Just keep destroying it. And then you'll be liberated. In the same way, Freire says, no church can be really prophetic if it remains the haven of the masses or the agent of modernization and conservation. The prophetic church is no home for the oppressed, alienating them further by empty denunciations. On the contrary, it invites them to a new exodus. In other words, an exodus from the world of oppression into the possibility of liberation. An invitation into Herbert Marcuse's great refusal. Do you not see how this all goes together? Herbert Marcuse's core of his philosophy through the 1960s was the great refusal of the existing society. Indeed, of any society that exists or ever exists. So this exodus is going to give you 40,000 years in the desert, and it's not going to be enough. It's not even the beginning. Permanent revolution. Hell of a prophetic vision. Destroy, 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 destroy. And when everything finally Every last thing is run down. Utopia emerges. That's the religion. Why do you think that they frame out the thing they're attacking as necrophiliac, death-loving, and consider themselves to be biophiliac? Because they invert everything. 
iron law of oak projection never misses. Now, Freire can't be content to leave things be. He says, nor is the prophetic church. He has to go hard. If you're going to, if you're going to go, go hard, right? He says, nor is the prophetic church one that chooses modernization and thereby does no more than stagnate. Christ was no conservative. Well, thank you for your opinion. But Marx's faith, remember, insists that conservative means anyone who rejects or hinders the dialectical process of history toward its utopian end. So therefore, when he's saying Christ was no conservative, he was saying Christ was a dialectical figure in history who knew he was a dialectical figure in history, hence him declaring himself to be the son of God, the son of the supreme being, which is the dialectical process of history realized. Do you get it yet? It's a religion. It is topsy-turvy, Satanized Christianity. The prophetic church, like him, like Christ, must move forward constantly, forever dying and forever being reborn. Let me just reread that part again, both of the sentences together with no interruption. Nor is the prophetic church one that chooses modernization and thereby does no more than stagnate. Christ was no conservative. The prophetic church, like him, must move forward constantly, forever dying and forever being reborn. So, first level thing to say about this, nothing shall be stable ever. That's cultural Marxism and critical Marxism. Ruthless criticism, denunciation of anything that exists, anything that's stable or potentially stabilizing, because those are counter-revolutionary. So, in practice, your church will be queered, and then it will use Jesus or whatever else or the gospel to go ahead and queer more people. Queering is the opposition of stability. That's what it means. All stability must be refused, destroyed, really, so that you can move forward constantly, forever dying and forever being reborn. Now, of course, that's heresy. That's a blatant heresy. The church, like Christ, must move forward constantly, forever dying and forever being reborn. That's dialectical theology. That is not Christianity. That is a heresy. I don't have to be a Christian to know that that's a complete heresy. Jesus died and was resurrected once. God created man. Man erred. There was the fall of man. He sinned. Sin entered the world. The wages of sin are death. But in his expression of perfect justice and perfect mercy, which seem contradictory, so an expression of God's perfection, God enables the atonement by bringing himself into the world as flesh to live a sinless life and then die willingly, self-sacrificially, to take upon himself the wages of sin. Then he rises from the grave three days later to overcome death and ascends into heaven triumphant, overcoming death, overcoming the wages of sin, thus paying the wages of sin, thus overcoming them and providing grace and salvation for man, for the error that he fell into when he disobeyed God because whatever reasons God had for that. That's the message. It is not that Jesus dies and is resurrected and then he does it again tomorrow and does it again tomorrow and does it again tomorrow. That's dialectic. That is not Christianity. The death and resurrection of Jesus is a singular act upon which the, the, the sin of the world is taken onto the Creator and is self-sacrificially paid for. That's the meaning of Christianity. And everybody can partake in this, say, through John 3.16, etc. That's the message of Christianity, not to Paulo Ferreri. The prophetic church, like Christ, must move forward constantly, forever dying and forever being reborn. With dialectical faiths like Marxism and Hegelianism, or the dialectical faith of leftism, that they're both in the track of, there is a death and rebirth on every revolution of the dialectic. They don't see the Trinity as a static thing is a singular thing that's three godheads co-eternal and perfect. It is a process. He just said that. It's a process. It is a process where the ideal becomes the material. The material becomes the spiritual. The spiritual is the realm of these contradictions playing out. And as they play out, people realize them. There's a shock and a revolution and there's a new ideal. That's Hegel's conception of the dialectic. And the new idea gives rise to a new material, and a new material it has been sublated to a higher level ideal. The ideal gives rise to a new material, and the material gives rise to a new spiritual or cultural, and then that's where the battleground plays out, and crack, there's a revolution. And every time it goes around, every time history makes a major turn or has a 
revolution goes around the circle again, there's a revolution that takes it to a higher level. It's a spiral, not a circle. Spiral through history that's narrowing closer and closer and closer to a final point when it drills down, and that's when the eschaton occurs and history ends and God realizes he's God, forever dying and forever being reborn. The ideal becomes material, becomes cultural or spiritual revolution becomes ideal, becomes material, becomes cultural or spiritual revolution. In the dialectical faith of Hegel or of Marx, the state ends up occupying the position of the son, which is to die self-sacrificially and be resurrected as a new state again and again and again until it perfects itself, at which point it self-sacrifices permanently and ends history. So the The oppressed seize the means of production. They establish a new state that is a dictatorship of their oppression that runs until it craps out, and then it happens again. The new oppressed seize the means, and every time it gets tighter and tighter and tighter until finally the state, as Marx had it, withers away in the end, at the end of history, and itself sacrifices itself when the utopia emerges as a perfect communism. That's their faith. That's their eschatology. It's a freaking religion. So let's read a little Ferrari, back up a little, and then come forward. Nor is the prophetic church one that chooses modernization and thereby does no more than stagnate. Christ was no conservative. The prophetic church, like him, must move forward constantly, forever dying and forever being reborn. In order to be, it must always be in a state of becoming. The prophetic church must also accept an existence that is in dramatic tension between past and future, staying and going, speaking the word and keeping silence, being and not being. See? Father becomes son, son becomes spirit, spirit revolutionizes the father. Becomes son, becomes new spirit, revolutionizes the father. Until finally they come together in a single point, and there is no deviation between them at all. In order to be, it must be always be in a state of becoming. The prophetic church must also accept an existence that is in dramatic tension between past and future. The present is the moment in between, staying and going, speaking the word and keeping silence, being and not being. The dialectical fusion is becoming. The present is the moment of becoming between past and future. Where you are now is between is, is where you have become to be is the spot between staying and going. The moment you begin to speak, rather than keeping silent, or stop speaking and begin keeping silent, is when silence or speech becomes. The spot between being and non-being, where being comes out of non-being, is becoming. That is the dialectical faith. This is their heresy. You can't have a little bit of this in your church, guys. There is no prophecy, he says, without risk. That's because everybody hates communists for damn good reasons. This prophetic attitude, which emerges in the praxis of numerous Christians and the challenging historical situation of Latin America, is accompanied by a rich and necessary, very necessary theological reflection. The theology of so-called development gives way to the theology of liberation, a prophetic utopian theology full of hope. That's because liberation is the Prisca Theologia. It is alchemical. It's not just Gnostic. It's also alchemical. It's hermetic. Little does it matter, he says, that this theology is not yet well systematized. Its content arises from the hopeless situation of dependent, exploited, invaded societies. In other words, it doesn't matter that it's immature, that it's ridiculous, that it's malformed, that it doesn't know how, that it doesn't know where it's going. In fact, it's not allowed to know where it's going. See, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that it has no idea what it's doing. It has the right nociological attitude, so give it power. Defer to it. Let Al Muller use it to transform your seminaries. It is stimulated, he says, the prophetic church, by the need to rise above the contradictions that explain and produce that dependence. Since it is prophetic, this theology of liberation cannot attempt to reconcile the irreconcilable. See, that's exactly what I'm saying. Now, he spends a bunch of paragraphs now talking about Latin America and the Latin American context. Um, Goes into the whole first world versus third world dichotomy, says that it's a social construction, that the first world opposes oppression through its not real. 
but we're not going to focus on that. Um, he says, thus it is clear that the educational role of the prophetic church must be totally different from that of the other churches we have discussed. Education must be an instrument of transforming action, a political praxis at the service of permanent human liberation. So your only choice is Marxist or evil, but the point is that you're going to turn your church into the same thing they turn the schools into, which are brainwashing programs for Marxism. That's your only choice. Once you accept their construction, which is, in a sense, heavily dependent upon Manichaean Gnosticism, which is a heresy. It's your only choice. This, let us repeat, he says, does not happen only in the consciousness of people, but presupposes a radical change of structures in which process consciousness will itself be transformed. And that, he said before, doesn't just happen. It has to be made to happen through praxis, which means it has to be made to happen through people who are doing praxis, and you can judge them as Jesus said, by their fruit. So you can think about who's been bringing the fruit, and then you can judge them that way. Don't judge them by their word, judge them by their fruit, and pay attention. Pay attention. What he's saying is that it's not enough to create the movement, because it's not real until society is structurally transformed. And that's what the World Economic Forum and its diabolical plans for your church and your faith are also attempting. Their goal is to build the structures, the new structure, the new system, the new economy, and the new religion of the future at the same time in parallel as they build the people who will occupy that new world. They're going to build the new people to go into the new world. They're building the new world that will be filled by the new people at the same time. And they have to use centers of education, including, as they see them, churches, in order to build the people we're going to fill those new structures. They're building the economy of the future, and they need to use education and faith to build the people of the future who will demand and accept that new world by transvaluating values. We all know it won't work, and we can already see. I would venture to guess that if they really try this, it will kill billions, billions with a B and with an S, as it fails, as it falls apart, and as it's forced upon us whether by hunger, whether by disease, whether by experimentation, whether by murder. Because it's being attempted at a global scale and with technology that we've never seen before. So we must fight. You must fight. You must get your church to fight. And we must win. Ferrari says, from the prophetic point of view, it makes a little difference in what specific area education happens. So it could be in your church. It's education. It's just another school, guys. It will always be an effort to clarify the concrete context in which the teacher students and the student teachers are educated and are united by their presence and action. It will always be a demythologizing praxis. So let's talk about another communist, Deng Xiaoping, who was the leader of the CCP for a period of time before now and after Mao. He said, I don't care whether the cat is black or white, so long as it catches mice. So it doesn't matter if it's school or church. It doesn't matter if it's secular or religious. It doesn't matter if it's Protestant or Catholic, Christian or not. So long as it's being used to conscientize and to take action to transform society. That's how they build their team. Ferrari says, this brings us back to our opening statement. The church, education, and the role of the churches in education can only be discussed historically. Again, that means in a Marxist sense. It is in history that mankind is called to respond to the prophetic movement in the third world. Called. It's a religion. And you're being called. He's saying that mankind is being called in history, Marxist dialectical conception, to the dialectical faith. And its options are to accept that call as the elect or be wholly depraved, totally depraved, privileged, as they say sinner and want to sin, access to power and want to keep access to power. That's the complete transvaluation of values for the new people who will inhabit the new world that they're trying to force into you through your faith. Your church, your faith, your religion are just another means to the one Marxist end, which is the same Gnostic lie recorded in Genesis 3 and most of the origin stories in the world and repeated throughout all the scriptures and has been repeated throughout history to disaster every single time. As Solzhenitsyn warns, this is the line of good and evil that splits every human heart. 
If they can transvaluate your values, they can subvert your values to serve their vision. If they can transvalue good to evil, that's them winning across that line. And it is to be accomplished by transvaluating your faith to serve their faith, which is an inversion and a deception. It's a deception with a capital D. It's an accusation of the existing order with a capital A. A deceiver, an accuser. What character is this? Who would cause a transvaluation or a transvaluative inversion of good and evil? It would be darkness posing as light. That's what they want to use your church to instill in people. And to just quote him one last time, and we'll close up without a lot of epilogue. Values cannot be justified by the intellectual process alone. Faith must be involved. Chairman of the World Economic Forum and Professor Klaus Schwab. Think about what's happening. Think about the stand you have to take. Think about what's at stake if you don't take this stand. Think about what you have to do. You must understand what's happening. You must understand the heresy and how it works. You must understand how it's implemented. You must understand who's implementing it. You must understand who's working alongside Klaus Schwab, like Rick Warren. And you must stop calling these people brothers. You must understand. And you must stop this. This is a catastrophe, the likes of which the world has never seen. And if you don't have the ability to get clear in your faith, you're in trouble and you're putting all of us in danger. You absolutely must come to this understanding. You absolutely must stand. You absolutely must be willing to take the people who are bringing this into the church and tell them to get out. Sorry, pray for you. Hope you repent. Tim Keller, your time's running out, buddy. Hope you repent. Hate to know what would happen to you. But we can't have you in a position of power and authority because we're not God, we're human, and we don't know what the contents of your heart are, and you've shown us you're a risk. You've got to go. Your authority has ended. You chose Klaus. That was a mistake.